The following material or information is created and distributed by a foreign agent Yuri Alexandrovich Dut or is related to activities conducted by Yuri Alexandrovich Dut. Is it true that there are dollar millionaires in North Korea? Well, the whole world stands against us. What does North Korean internet look Orwell like? on steroids. I don't want to live here anymore. He's not doing this for you. Great leader, thank you for the food. He thinks it's the same for the whole world. They use cash? They were told to cry and they did. To see North Korea. Andrei Nikolaevich, you are one of the biggest experts on North Korea. Not only in Russian-speaking community, but you're one of the biggest experts in the world. Uh, North Korea has become relevant again. It has. It's relevant to Russians especially. It's true. They're one of our few friends, so to speak. No, they're not our friends. They are our situational ally. Even more so. So we've come to you to talk about North Korea. Uh, I'm going to ask you dozens of the simplest questions Let's do about it. this country. Let me clarify. We're shooting this interview in Seoul. Uh, we cannot go to North Korea for now. Absolutely. Private individuals are not allowed. Even some diplomats are not allowed. If you want to see some documentaries about North Korea, there are many videos out there on YouTube Then you can watch. Um, for example, Anton Ladov made a big episode shot mm -hmm. in North Korea. Have you watched it? I have. How did you like it? It was good. It was good. So, documentaries are out there on YouTube. Here, we would like to talk to you as a person who has immense knowledge on this country. Gain not by simply visiting it, but rather as a result of careful studies for many years. Uh, how long have you been in love with North Korea? Well, basically, since I first visited in 1984, I would say, I got lucky. I was among the Korean historians from the, uh, the Soviet Union who were allowed to come for an internship in Pyongyang, uh, almost all of them. And it was... Uh, it was 1984, yes. almost 40 years ago. Almost 40 years. How many times that. have you been to North Korea since then? About 10 times overall, I guess. They keep blacklisting and then whitelisting me. And I paid my last visit to North Korea in 2018 after my 2016 step. Have you counted how many days or months you spend there in total? My first trip was long, but later I would come for a couple of days or weeks. So overall, I believe I've spent there a bit more than a year, about a year or so, I guess I would say. I never thought that there is a place, not in the demilitarized zone, but rather near Seoul, where you can come and see North Korea. Yeah, this, this is, North, is Korea. North Korea. And? This is North Korea. Well, yeah, actually. Uh, but, I mean, it's so close to Seoul. Well, actually, Seoul is located on the border. When sometimes they say that the biggest artillery unit in the world is located north from Seoul, then, then this unit belongs to North Korea. Uh, some people think that it's an exaggeration, but, uh, but it's not. Seoul suburbs are located right at the border. Yes, indeed. So Seoul population is around 10 million people. And the whole capital area reaches 25 million in population. Well, this is dangerous, isn't it? This is extremely dangerous. This is why in 1953, when the treaty agreement had been signed, the commanders tried to dissuade President Singh Minri from coming back to Seoul because... We, they wanted Busan to be well, the capital. Yes, to keep the capital in Busan, which was the capital during the war. But since the Singh Minri knew that Seoul had been a capital for about six centuries, and since he was quite popular among the people, the fact that he controlled Seoul and was stationed there was a matter of his reputation. And that's how Seoul became the capital again. So there you have it. In the current situation, here is pretty tense from the military standpoint, and they don't even need any nuclear weapons. So there, North Korea has over 300 units of heavy artillery that covers the entire capital city of Seoul. 
Well, since this is the case, there should be a major anti-air defense well, around here. Well, there's plenty of it. You just can't see it. There was a military facility right over there. Uh-huh. Um, it's, uh, it's hard to see, but it's all there. I think when you just are driving, I think on a highway, you might see some nice gates, but these units are not gates. These are instant anti-tank fortification to deployment systems. And they can blow concrete blocks. They crumble and block the highway. And it's actually all over the place. And you would notice them if you don't know about them. And there's more. However, in case it comes to something really serious, even without using nuclear weapons, Seoul would definitely suffer a lot. Oh, wow. I mean, this sounds crazy. Uh, to be honest, like two years ago, I wouldn't even be interested in this. I would consider this too <laughs> hypothetical, you know, <laughs> like it's there to accumulate and increase uh, military spendings and for the politics to keep themselves busy, pretty much. <laughs> But now, after what happened, I mean, uh, after Russia invaded Ukraine, everything's <laughs> changed. It's a new way of thinking for me now. I will allow me to add something. There is also in Taiwan. Nothing's happened there uh, yet. Uh, there is Karabakh. There's the Middle East. There are a lot of interesting places, really. It seems like we live in a world where military conflicts are becoming more acceptable right now. And we'll... We'll see what happens next. For now, yes, I can't agree with you because it has become more relevant. We're in Barcelona at Avenida Diagonal, and this is one of the most unusual buildings around here. It's some sort of flower bed building. There are plants on every balcony here, so this building looks very, very green. And it's not the only flower bed house in Europe. There are similar buildings in Milan and Paris. In Paris, it's simply called Flower Tower. Broad street, heavy traffic, concrete and glass. But then you turn your head and you see this green beauty. We've actually come here to remind you that there's always time for flowers in your life. This is an ad of Flower Wow Marketplace. With it, you can order flowers and other gifts with quick delivery in a thousand cities and 30 countries across the globe, including UAE, Great Britain, Spain, and many others. Apart from flowers, Flower Wow has a wide selection of desserts, plants, jewelry, and decorations from local manufacturers. If you've left Russia but want to send gifts to your close ones, Flower Wow is a great way to do so. I do it myself regularly. Flower Wow is partnering with other stores in most of Russian cities, and you can place your order pretty fast, and it's very easy to do. Let me show you. You pick a gift that you want to order, you open the chat if you're willing to adjust the details, the store would send you the picture of your order before delivery. After your confirmation, the order is accepted and is transferred for delivery. The delivery time starts from 30 minutes. You have to type the exact address. The name and the phone number of the recipient are more than enough. And to make sure you don't miss sending any gifts, you can use the integrated calendar with all birthdays and other important dates. I really like this calendar because I'm always forgetting about others' birthdays. Speaking of important dates, on November 26th is an international Mother's Day, so if you've never used Flowwow app, it's a good time to download it. You can use promo code DUD15 to get a 15% discount on your first order. Even if you don't use the promo code now, save it for later. The promo code is available until March 30th. First, so we can use it on Christmas or International Women's Day. The link to Flower app is in the description below. Let's go. Is this a town over there? Yeah, yes, of course, that's a town. Are there. there any people in this town? There are. Well, it's, it's a, a closed city, and so you must be authorized to enter, but it's all over Korea, actually. Uh, north of Korea, obviously. So you must be authorized to enter this area. But are those people civilians or special service agents? Special agents. agents. They're all civilians, local peasants plowing the land. So, yeah. I mean, there are people who, I'd like to make it clear, yeah. uh, there are people who, yes. if by any chance they had binoculars, they so do have binoculars. those people are able to see this large South Korea flag yes, on daily yes. basis. So uh, on this land, there's internet, freedom and mm-hmm. democracy basically, and over there, there is nothing. Well, uh, to begin with, uh, they do have their internet. Yeah, we'll talk about yes. that later during the interview. Yes, well, keep in mind, there are no random people in this town, so to enter this area, 
uh, North Koreans must first gain entry number, so to speak. Uh, so any individual entering this zone must be authorized by the Ministry of Internal Affairs in Pyongyang. It is a so-called red stripe permission. So uh, regular uh, North Korean tourists can't enter this town at all. Um, although regular people live there, and there is a school with regular teachers, uh, North Korean education is quite good, by the way. But still, there are there are people plowing the land, no, nothing unusual. Oh, and yet the teacher tells the kids that, uh, I mean, she tells them about U.S.-occupied Korean soil, uh, visible right outside the school window. Well, they do admit, regrettably, that the life in South Korea is good. They just don't say how good it is. I mean, the gap is obviously huge. And in documents that the North Korean side hands over to foreigners, they acknowledge quite realistically the dimensions of the, of the gap. And of course, they do not advertise it at home, but the fact that South Korea lives a little bit better, uh, this is generally recognized. And so that is why in recent years, say, they have almost completely stopped publishing uh, any information about the South Korea in their press. They don't want to remind people about it. Is it true that Kim Jong-il's original name at his birth was Yuri? Well, of course, that's true. Uh, he was born in the Soviet Union, recorded in the Soviet Registry Office, uh, and his father's name was uh, Jing Ji Chang. That's why it was written in the papers. Because at that time, Kim Il-sung, this is also not his real name, it's his uh, combat nickname. He was a field commander, and after what remained of his guerrilla detachment in Manchuria went to the territory of the Soviet Union. He served in the Soviet Army in the 80th Brigade. And in the 80th Brigade, accordingly, uh, he was um, uh, using Chinese. Well, not a Chinese name. The thing is that any hieroglyph has a Chinese, Japanese, Vietnamese, and Korean reading. And accordingly, since the brigade mainly consisted from Chinese soldiers... Uh, there was one battalion of Koreans there. The language in the brigade was uh, Chinese, and therefore he was registered like that. So he was called Yuri Zhichenovich uh, Jin at birth. As far as I know, North Korean propaganda is trying to erase all these details. Well, of course they are. And everything that they teach in North Korean schools, they teach it differently. They don't say a word about the fact that Kim Il-sung, uh, first of all, served in the Red Army. Well, of course not. And secondly, about the fact that he started the war. Of course I mean, not. Korean War. And about the fact that he nearly lost it. Well, they say something like, uh, we were attacked, and then we responded with a powerful counterattack, and then the evil Americans almost defeated us, but then we managed to come back. I heard they also rewrited Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il's yeah, speeches. Yeah, of course. Oh, of course. Old ones. But for example, in 1945, Kim Il-sung's uh, first speech happened on October 14th, and he mainly thinks the Soviet army in it. But in the subsequent version of history, which starts from the 1960s, the official statement is that the Soviet army, we, so to speak, auxiliary forces, uh, North Korea was liberated by the heroic North Korean uh, armed forces under the command of Kim Il-sung by the Korean People's Revolutionary Army. And the army never existed. But officially, in North Korea, it is stated that when Kim Il-sung went to the Soviet Union, by the way, it is admitted, but also it is said that he had a secret base in Korea. And another base under Habarovsk, too, in total. There was no base in Korea. It's a pure fiction. And his activity is very well traced, and all of the documents of the 88th Brigade have long been declassified and partially published. Um, but that's not the point. And it is said that it was not the Soviet army, but there were bases of the Korean People's Revolutionary Army. Um, it was not the 1st Battalion of the 80th Separate Brigade, but simply the Korean People's Revolutionary Army. And it struck a blow. Moreover, as described in the most daring fantasies, this is all about how Kim Il-sung went to consult uh, with Zhukov. Well, Zhukov was the commander of the Allied Army, so of course he went to see him. And they discussed how he was going to beat the Japanese. But about the Soviet Army, well, they do admit that it also participated. This is not denied. And monuments to our soldiers stand there. They do exist. But as they say now, our allies helped us a little bit, but mostly we liberated ourselves. This is generally the main line of propaganda. The thing is that Kim Il-sung joined the Chinese Communist Party, and he was a member of the Chinese Communist Party, and this can be talked about. He served first in the Chinese, then in the Soviet Armed Forces, moreover, not in very high positions. This can also not be talked about. Why? He is a national leader. Mm. And the Koreans are building a history that would be free of foreign influence, a nationally pure history.
It sounds quite familiar. Well, I understand why this sounds familiar to you right now, but you know, it sounds familiar to me in regard to not one, not two, but dozens of other countries. To a certain degree, by the way, this is true for everyone. It's just the with the Koreans, what is interesting about North Korea is that there are tendencies that are characteristic of many other countries, but in a somewhat exaggeratedly caricatured form. Well, for example, do they say a lot in America about the role of French troops in the uh, uh, in the American Revolution, in the War of Independence of the United States? Far from it. But of course, significantly more than is told in North Korea about the Soviet troops' role in the struggle against Japan. Well, in general, as far as I understand, in the States, the position on the uh, distribution of roles in World War II is well, of somewhat course, different of from course, European. That's normal. But the thing is, um, A, it's a lie. And if you're a normal historian, not a propagandist pretending to be a historian, you read it with a smile. And B, North Korea, like in many other cases, takes it all to its logical conclusion and even a little bit further. Is it true that in North Korea they have very little uh, paved roads? Oh, there were practically none. The last time I was there in 2018, we were driving in the largest border city of Sinuiju is nearby, um, uh, along a dirt road, of course. There were practically... Um, there are highways, but very few people use them, and they're almost empty. There are big restrictions. Most vehicles uh, just um, just simply cannot use these roads. And, uh, and these are somewhat, like, you get car sick, basically. Uh, and even in a good car, when you drive on a North Korean highway, you get car sick. The roads are bumpy. Uh, is it because it's built that way well, or the, the quality. pavement quality it's is It's about bad. the quality. Well, any quality costs money and there's a lack of money. Uh-huh. So, so I remember, I looked, we, we drove 47 kilometers in two hours on a good car. So... The primary transport is railways. Uh, are there potholes? Uh, there were like... potholes, and after the rain, it gets a little bit wet and slippery, uh, uh, bumpy. You just can't drive fast. When we were driving slowly, so we drove about 20 kilometers per hour, yes. All right, just to make it clear, I'm going to be asking a lot of yeah, very simple course, questions about everyday life, and none of them is tinged with mockery or giggling. It's pure curiosity. So, cars. Are there private cars there? Yes, of course. Uh, they have always been there, and they have always been there in small numbers, and now there are quite a few of them. Uh, formally, you can register a car as private, and this is quite legal. But even the license plate system, their license plates for private cars, well, it's hard to explain the system, but simplifying it a bit, the numbers are four-digit. It is believed that the maximum number is 9999. Oh, so very few of them. Yes. But this should not be misleading. The thing is that a person who has a private car, and there are not so few of them in general, well, naturally, the entire car fleet, there are about a quarter of a million cars, uh, that makes it uh, exactly a hundred times less than here. And the population is twice as small, but there are there, and it's better to register with some state organization. Uh, if you if you have money to buy a car, then you will then you will definitely find money to resolve the issue with some sort of state organization here, even with a kindergarten, and have your car uh, accepted on the balance, as we used to say in the Soviet times. Uh, so with a state organization, it's easier. You'll have an easier time with car service, and there will be fewer problems and so what on. What kind of cars are there? Mainly Chinese? Uh, Chinese, uh, yes, but mostly there are foreign brands and Japanese, any kind, but, but of course Chinese assembly. And now, in fact, Chinese cars have entered the market, yes. There used to be quite a lot of used Japanese cars, uh, but uh, yeah, but now there are almost none left. Is it true that all Koreans must have a portrait of the senior Kims at home? It's mandatory. Well, what can I say? Uh, there must be a set of portraits, either three portraits, including Kim Jong Il, Kim Il Sung, and Kim Jong Suk. Uh, Kim Il Sung's wife, formerly the the first, in fact, the second, uh, who was the mother of Kim Jong Il. This is if you are a boss, then it's three portraits, and if you are a simple Korean citizen, then the other set of portraits also Kim Jong Il and uh, Kim Il-sung. And the third portrait is both Kims talking together about some important state affairs. They don't need to have Kim Jong-suk portraits. And they must be dusted daily, right? Yeah, yes. There was a special set. A special set includes um, a special uh, little box, and in it are a brush and a cloth. Not just any cloth, but this is a special one, uh, specifically for carrying for the portraits. And they have serviced the checks that the portraits are in proper condition. Uh, well, if they are at work, so to speak, this is periodically checked in the office. The portraits must be in every office. At work, the management carries out the checks or party uh, management. Can they come to your home? At home. Well, for homes, there's in Minban, the people's group. 
This uh, group consists of 20, 30, 40 families, and the head of such a group is usually a lady of middle age, and she not only can, but she is obliged to come to your home periodically and check if everything is in order. This, by the way, is in a very broad sense, whether your portraits are in order and or if you're, uh, or how are your family relations, uh, checks if there's no domestic violence or occasionally how the children are abroad and much more. Because she in general is responsible for any misbehavior in this territory. It is her right to come into your home. And you cannot say, I do not want to talk to you, building manager lady. This is not a building manager. Her powers are much greater. She comes and looks and checks. She's like Nona Mordukova's character from the Diamond Arm movie. Yes, but with much greater power. So Nona Mordukova from the Diamond Arm could not come home and ask you, tell me, please, so what was your salary last year and where did you get the money for this cupboard right here? But the head of the people's group... Uh, uh, this person can not only can, but she is obliged to ask this. Uh, yes. Well, not until lately, but uh, somewhere until the 1990s, she was obliged to do so. In North Korea, there is such a wonderful tradition as a residence check. There are random checks, uh, although rumors circulate that people are often warned. But somewhere around midnight, I guess, uh, this happens and random inspections are conducted. And all 20, 30, 40 families are checked. A, um, a patrol comes there and and checks who is sleeping there. They also check if the radio receiver was sealed, if they have a radio, if the television is sealed in certain areas where Chinese, where South Korean broadcasting can be heard, and, well, and all other things. Were you there last time in 2018? Yes, in 2018 in spring. Oh, what do you feel when you're close by? Do you feel attraction? Of course I do, but now the, the situation there is, uh, they're still lifting traveling restrictions, so I think I won't be going there for several more years. Is this because of COVID? You know, well, yes. In fact, their country is still closed for tourists. And moreover, so to speak, uh, sometimes the North Koreans get offended by me. They don't let me in. Sometimes on the contrary, they invite me and it happens both ways. Why are you allowed to enter at all, considering that you tell about the country in great detail, even though with much love? Well, but we're going to talk about that later. It's they notice that I don't tell it in a way that describes them as villains who need to be destroyed somehow. I understand that this is an unpleasant regime. I myself would not want to live there at all. I understand those who do not want to live there. Well, it so happened it turned out to be that way historically, and I assure you, I, uh, I say this calmly. Well, I feel a little sorry for them all, from the for the political prisoners to Kim Jong-un, they are all, to some extent, prisoners of the, of the decisions that, moreover, when they were made, looked correct. So here was the tragedy of North Korea, that those decisions that led to the current situation here, at the moment when those decisions were made, they sounded quite logical. And if, well, theoretically speaking, I had lived there and found myself among those who had made these decisions, then then I might have acted the same way. And as a result, the situation got messed up hopelessly. But returning to your question in general, um, well, in, in general, among those who, so to speak, follow me, they see this. Although, of course, many things that I say often make them angry because I am not going to, so to speak, play along with their, uh, with their, uh, with their ideas. And sometimes I say things that they don't want to hear about themselves at all. Are you never afraid that when you are there that you might... Uh well, well not really. Me, you might but, be taken hostage, basically. But, well, not really, but sometimes probably this thought crosses my mind, but not very often. So, yes. So I say, when they don't like me, they just don't give me a visa. And when they like me, they give me a visa. Let's make it clear right off the bat. All the information you're talking about was relevant in 2018. Y yes, of course, even in 2020. How do you keep track of whether it is still relevant? Well, this is problematic. The thing is that in the last couple of years, it has been very bad with the stream information because very much is passed through China, through North Koreans who work in China and live in China. And uh, this is not the only source of information. But uh, in principle, the times when it was possible to communicate so calmly with people in China have passed. In North Korea itself, it's not possible to discuss these topics, or rather you shouldn't. But to be honest, sometimes it's not possible. Sometimes it's possible. But you must be very careful. Uh, the source of knowledge is always either the defectors yes. or those who are in China. Yes, North those Koreans who for, are allowed to stay in China. Uh, yes, those who, who, for various reasons, are willing to talk. Look, as we were driving, there's a highway leading from Seoul to this place, and there's barbed wire well, everywhere. Yes, here it is, the border river. No, I mean from South Korean yes, side. Yes, of course. I'm on both sides. Uh, uh, 
Uh, why is that? In case someone wants to... Well, so that the saboteurs do not sneak around. And one of the problems of North Korea is that they are very bad at technical intelligence. Uh, they do not have the possibility to conduct satellite reconnaissance. They don't have any allies who would share uh, the data. The data. Well, uh, uh, the data, at least in real time. Maybe they can get something, but but first they will have to negotiate for so long that by the time that information will become outdated. So they need to find out, is the South planning something? And how is it done? And is it done the old-fashioned way? There's a detachment, a reconnaissance group that crawls to the airfield to see what is happening there. Meanwhile, they, of course, can be caught. Of course, the South Koreans do not want the North Koreans to crawl to the airfield, so there you have it. That's why it's all here. Moreover, there was a recently a scandal uh, during the, the, the times of COVID. Some guys from one of these collected farms did not like his life over there, and it's clear. He got tired of looking at the beautiful lights, which, as you said, are quite visible over here. And so he swam across the river. Moreover, both of these border guards and those border guards missed it. But this is just the beginning of the story. He came here. He didn't like it here. Moreover, he got into some sort of criminal story, purely out of stupidity and inexperience. But I mean, here in South Korea. And then he said that it would be better to go back. And he swam back across the river in the sight of the border guards. Really? Like... Yes. Breaststroke? There he's back again. Moreover, the border guards did not notice yet again. He went to his friends, hid at his friends' home for some time, and then came to surrender to the authorities. Uh, to the North Korean yes. authorities, right? And in addition, he was sick with some sort of flu-like symptoms, as it turned out later, but it looked very much like COVID. Uh -huh. and there was immediate panic. And after that, both there and here, the border guards were screwed up so much that it all ended sadly for them. Because when a South Korean petty official with countless debts tries to escape to the north, then those screwed up border guards just, well, they, they simply shot him in the heat in the end, I suppose. And just because after this story, everyone was told to make sure that not a single gnat could cross from both sides. Uh, just to make sure, is the fate of that man from the collective farm who returned from the north uh, known? It's unknown, but I think that it's nothing terrible. Of course, he will now be working in the collective farm for the rest of his life. Moreover, in a So remote he's one, not getting in prison for the escape? Uh, well, it may happen in different ways. Theoretically, he may be in prison for some time because this was a big deal. But 10 years ago, they changed their position towards the returnees. If a person returns, then... Well, there were several dozens of these cases. Out of about 34,000 escapes from the north to the south since 1953, uh, the majority, say, in the last 20 years, uh, only several dozen fled back. And there were even extremely, so to speak, interesting cases when a person kept running back and forth three times. But this is an exception. Uh, so there is no happiness anywhere. So in, in such a case, if a person came running... Then they would sometimes arrange a propaganda tour for him. They write him a lecture there. He tells people how he was offended in the South and how bad it was for him here, so to speak. A repentance tour. Yes, a repentance tour for propaganda and educational purposes. And then, as as far as we can judge, nothing serious really happens to this person. Of course, this puts a red line on a person's career. Although, what kind of career does a guy have from a collective farm, right? Is it even possible for him to leave? Okay, uh, tell us about the second one, the official from the South yes. who fled to the North. You said that his motive was he got that into he, some uh, crazy debts and uh, decided to escape to the north. Moreover, this is quite unexpected because the North Koreans have not been accepting defectors from the south at all for about 10 to 15 years. Uh -huh. So if a person gets there somehow, there are a few such cases. There are a maximum of four or five cases a year, um, even fewer now. Uh, but the North Koreans do not accept them. They send them back. But the, the man crawled. And then there was a completely murky story. Apparently, he was detained at a guard post. And according to the North Korean version, he psyched out and started twitching. And then they just shot him so that he wouldn't run away. And they thought that he was trying to run away. And according to the South Korean version, the North Koreans were actively consulting. And apparently, one of the superiors said, shoot this guy. Or we might have this sort of back and forth running story again. Those were North Koreans. The North who shot Koreans, him. yes, they both say this. The only disagreement is the South and the North Korean versions completely coincide with this story. And uh, the only thing they disagree on is that the North Koreans claim that he was killed while trying to escape. Uh -huh. 
And the South Koreans claim that he was killed after several hours of deliberation on what to do with him. To what extent it is generally acceptable to use defectors as a source of information? I mean, how can they be considered as reliable sources? Oh, the question is tricky. The thing is that I never ask them questions, or at least I avoid asking questions. Or if they arise, I do not really take their answers to questions of a political nature very seriously. Uh, I am interested in completely different things. Like, how much does grain cost? How did you raise pigs, so to speak? What institution provided you with this truck, I suppose? A private truck of a private farmer, that is. These are the questions I usually ask them. And uh, firstly, they can be perfectly verified because they are, are not many of these topics the, that interest me. It is mainly about the North Korean new economy. And... Uh, almost everyone works, I suppose, more or less similarly. And also things related to prices, to basic things like, uh, or some mass rituals, for example, how to care for portraits of the leaders. Moreover, there is another point. In principle, so to speak, there are people in South Korea who, of course, do not talk with half a percent of all defectors. I'm sorry, maybe even less than half a percent. Yes, somewhere around that number. Uh, but there are also people who have talked with perhaps even 25%, and they also document this. Unfortunately, almost everything substantial that is published about North Korea is published in Korean. The world doesn't care much. What I am really doing is not interesting to the world. And in the world, North Korea is perceived either as a boogeyman, like Warwell on steroids, I suppose, or as... Well, some kind of, well, in the Soviet Union, there is this characteristic, especially in CIS countries, and it is perceived as a lost paradise of the Soviet Union. And most importantly, this lost paradise has missiles, and there are military issues. Everybody studies them, like diplomats. Many people are engaged in academic and various other researches. Uh, but everyday life, everyday economy is studied much less. History is also studied carefully, though. Contrary to popular belief, the archives, by the way, are very well declassified, including in Russia. Many say classified archives. No, they're not classified at all. Almost everything is declassified up until the end of the 1970s. How likely is it that the information that was relevant in 2020 will be outdated by 2023? It's the thing is now that North Korea is going through a very turbulent period, I think. And apparently some new period of their history begins. Well, as usual, at historical turning points, information can become outdated not in years, but in months. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the country gradually is opening up. Information is being released again bit by bit, and I think not at the same time level as it used to be. North Korea will now be much more isolated than it was before, but we will have some pretty decent information. Moreover, I'm interested in things. You see, I'm not interested in the secrets of the Politburo. Of course, they do not interest me, but even if they tell me about them, I will not believe it. Because I don't know, is the person telling me the truth or not? And even if it is the truth, why is he telling me this truth? Maybe he's leaking it on purpose for some reason. No, we want to hear about everyday life first Well, of all. when it comes to everyday life, if if you'll pardon me, there are plenty of ladies who will tell you just how they they buy pork at the market. There's plenty of them there. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, then we'll just give a disclaimer that the information you give us, well... You're confident that the information is valid up until well, what year? Until, until about 2020. You should understand that when we talk, for example, about a whole range of procedures that were established back in the 1950s and 60s, the probability that they have changed them is small. In Squid Game, uh, there was yes. a girl who... Um, North Korean, yes. Yeah, yes, she fled North Korea. Yes, yes, yes. And yes, there, yes. if I remember it right, she discussed with the uh, protagonist that she had escaped on her own and wants to return Good back to... Well, yeah, she wants to get the money and return back to pull out her family. Yeah, it's a common practice. Escape to the North, excuse me, escape from the North... Um, is our little secret that everyone knows about well, it's purely commercial operation here. There is practically no ideological component to this. So, well, maybe maybe South Korean special services are pulling out some particularly useful people, although I even doubt that, because I don't really think that they would even pull anyone out really useful even if they wanted to. So in general, it's a pretty purely financial operation. And if we're talking about the pre-COVID situation, it looked like this. There were professional brokers, as they were called, and they organized the extraction of a person for money. 
Brokers, you mean from South Korea? No, they're stationed in China. Part of them is North Koreans living in China legally or illegally. Another part of them is North Koreans who fled to the South, received South Korean citizenship, and are now also based in China. Some of them are South Koreans, some of them are Chinese. Uh huh. Okay. Now for money, uh, they're stationed outside North Korea, right? They're stationed and in so China. So for money, they're willing to smuggle people. Yes, absolutely correct. Uh, normally, it goes like this: crossing the border. Usually, the broker does not deal with this, but for a large amount of money, he can. I see. Okay.、Uh, how much does it cost to get a person the, out of there? The prices originate in the 2010s. So now, in the post-COVID world, it's a little bit perplex. But there will be some new structure called. We don't know how what it'll be yet. So the, the the prices, if we're talking about China, crossing the border is expensive, very expensive nowadays.、It、used to be free, now it's expensive. So in case of China, it's between three and five thousand, the cheapest way. Dollars? Yes, yes, of course. Ten、uh, uh, to fifteen. You mean smuggle well, for China? Well, if the person is physically present in China. Oh, to get him to South Korea. To smuggle him from China to South Korea without、oh, documents. Okay.、Uh, so like in China, he can break through on his own, more or less, because there are ways there too. Well, he could before. So、yeah. now the North Koreans, for the last ten years, they have the border closed. The thing is that the border line between China and North Korea was almost unguarded. Yeah, you said several times、yes. in interviews that you went、yeah. there and were amazed well, even, that there was seventy kilometers of guard posts.、Uh, yes, even more、yeah. than a hundred, I would say. So the border was unguarded, and now it is guarded, and、uh-huh. it is no longer possible to cross it without paying a very large amount, which is now measured in many thousands of dollars. But this now is different. This is not a broker. Brokers very rarely deal with this. There are specialists, and there are a few of them, and their prices are completely different. But when a person ended up in China, it was from three to five thousand, or rather, th- from three to four, probably five thousand is already a little bit too much for the end of the 2010s. So the route was North Korea, then China, then South well, Korea. Pardon me, you can't take a direct. Oh, so、route. there is no direct route, right? For fifteen thousand dollars, there can be one. Every win for your money. That's、wow. what a broker would tell you. Fifteen thousand dollars. Yes. So is it by boat or well, 15, through the woods? Well, fifteen thousand dollars. But there is no land border. Forest is not an option either. Only through the Siberian taiga.、Uh-huh. If you're lucky enough to think it covered the FSB, that is. So you pay fifteen thousand dollars. You get a fake passport. A well-made fake passport with your name inside. You mean of it. South Korean passport? Any any kind of、okay. passport. South Korean is easier, but it can be Dominican. You get a fake passport. And with this fake passport, you simply fly out of any Chinese city that has direct air communication with South Korea. Uh huh. You arrive in South Korea, go to the border control, and say, "Here is my passport, right here, but it is fake. I am a citizen of North Korea." The girl at the border control—it's—it's it's almost always female in signs. So, well, not in signs, but still,、uh, you know what I mean. Well, this is actually true. Yes, she presses a button. Done. A group of people in plain clothes from the National Intelligence Services come in, and they even have a room there, so they take you with you. And then the standard questioning procedure begins, and then they give you a brief overview of local life here. So they briefly explain how to use the subway and pay with a card. And then, well, that's it. You get South Korean citizenship. Is the rumor that there's hunger in North Korea outdated? Malnutrition, rather not hunger. Malnutrition in certain areas. Okay, what's the difference between malnutrition? And hunger, hunger is what people die from. What statistically noticeably increases the level of mortality. And malnutrition means that a person does not receive the medically necessary number of calories and nutrients. But there was famine in mid '90s.、Right? There was a famine from 1995 to 1996 to 1999 to 2000. About half a million dead. About half a million dead. Yes. In short, this happened because there was no more help from the Soviet Union. Yes, yes. And in addition, and they had their own failures yeah, in agriculture. Yes. Well, their own foolishly organized agriculture, starting from the collective farm system. Moreover, minus personal plots. Personal plots were forbidden. Then、uh, they later arose spontaneously, but then they were forbidden. Uh, plus the the construction of terraced fields, which were washed away by the rain.、Uh, plus a very big roll of mineral fertilizers, an immense quantity of various、uh, nitrates went into the soil. And w- when the factories for the production of mineral fertilizers stopped because they depended on electricity, depended on the supply of components from the Soviet Union and China. Well, the cessation of Soviet and Chinese aid plus, yeah, yes, it's exactly this. What does the average North Korean normally eat now? 
Well, outside of Pyongyang, one eats boiled corn, in addition to spicy pickled, spicy fermented, that is not pickled, of course, but the fermented kimchi cabbage. Uh, how often do they eat meat? Uh, the consumption of has increased, so the average is like 10 kilograms a year, which means approximately one kilogram a month. But before it was four, five, six kilograms. Now it is already somewhere around 10, even a little more than 10. But again, this is data coming from before the 2020. Uh, are so we now talking about now. the provinces or the Pyongyang? Well, this is on average across the country. Uh, in Pyongyang, of course, it can be more, maybe even two or three is times more. Is it less than a kilogram yes, a month? Yes, but this is more than ever before. Uh-huh. But mainly, so to speak, uh, a people's person, uh, not a rich person, uh, but the majority of the population here, they would eat, I would say, boiled corn, sometimes from time to time, but not daily, they eat rice. Oh, rice is good food. This is such a moderately festive food. But they can eat some sort of fish. Sometimes they eat an egg or two, chicken, meat, but this is rare, not daily, definitely not every day. Animal protein is not daily food. Let's say I'm a resident of yes. Pyongyang. Yes. So it turned out like that, and I'm 37 yes. years old. I live in yes. Pyongyang. Well, you're uh, unlucky, but never mind. Yeah, God forbid. It could be worse. So, um, so I, I, I don't want to live here anymore. Well, it happens, yes. Well, that's clear. Uh, what, what can I do? Uh, so this depends very much on what kind of resident of Pyongyang you are. If you have the opportunity... You can either get a passport and then then take away to China. In theory, this is possible. Like, for what? Uh, well, a tourist trip? Uh, or? Well, tourist trips, not really, but visiting relatives is possible. Oh, okay. Moreover, relatives could be fabricated until recently. Uh, for example, someone you know can make a fake invitation for you from a suddenly discovered Chinese aunt, and you could stay there for a while. So you go to China, and... Do not become a returnee. And there you pay a broker, and he delivers you. And if you pay from three to five thousand dollars, then he takes you across all of China by trains. Sometimes they rent a bus to make sure that the, you don't get caught by the Chinese police. They can arrest you and send you back to North Korea. Uh, so they take you across China. Then you illegally cross the border with Laos through swamps and jungles teeming with crocodiles and other unpleasant animals. And then what you can do is you float down the Mekong and then you reach Thailand and come to the South Korean embassy there. Oh. And receive temporary exit documents and send you to South Korea. And if you have money, you get a fake passport and fly there directly from China. The first option is cheaper by like five times. Uh-huh. Okay, all right. Uh, and South Koreans are ready to accept you. Well, how could so, they not accept you if, according to the South Korean Constitution, any citizen... You mean citizen, the citizens of the Republic of, course, of Korea of course, live out there? Because according to the South Korean Constitution, the DPRK does not exist. When I asked you about the girl from Squid Game, uh, I've been watching it with minimal knowledge about North Korea. And it mm. seemed to me that the fact that she escaped on her own is already some incredible luck. And to think about the fact that you can actually try to... Mm. Take someone else no, with no, you. No, it's it common. basically sounds it's totally unrealistic. No, or, or is it this was, a, this was a big problem here. The the South Korean government, which deep down is not very happy about the presence of North Koreans with the arrival of North Koreans here. At one time, they found that upon arrival, the South Korean received, um, excuse North me, North Korean. Korean refugee received a large subsidy for settling in, and then. Uh, th this refugee took the subsidy and using it, he hired brokers who brought his family here. And uh, and one of the reasons why, firstly, the government reduced the subsidy, and secondly, uh, they decided to pay it not at once, but in several parts. Well, one reason is that the North Koreans were often deceived. South Korea is a country with very low crime level, but this does not apply to scammers, because there are all kinds of scams that are quite common here. And North Koreans very often fell for this. So the second problem is that they gave this money to the brokers, And in order to avoid this, they canceled one-time payments and introduced partial payments within several years. And this is absolutely common practice. Moreover, probably the majority of those who fled here, about 34,000, are, are people who... Are, are people who found themselves in this way will people leave. So, well, for example, I knew, I still know them, and they lived not far from me, uh, a family. They were very successful farmers, and they had a large private farm. And this is actually illegal, but not in North Korea. Nobody cares about this. It's legal partially. A small pig farm and private fields in the mountains. Uh, they even had their own truck. 
gas generator, by the way, a very exotic one, which emits smoke. And unknowing oh. people think that this is, well, yes, unknowing yeah. people think that this is a steam engine. This is not a steam engine, but a gas generator on an internal combustion engine. Well, they used to make these. Um, uh, and the husband, so the way they managed to get prosperous was the husband managed to go to Russia to work in the early 1990s. He worked in well, he worked in Russia or some money, and then they used this money to get prosperous, and they're very hardworking people. Um, it reminds me a little bit of the psychology of the psychology of strong peasants. So they say, oh, what famine? They only the lazy die famine. So, well, yes, I was just saying. Yeah. And the husband left for a second time again to Russia, and he is a bulldozer operator, crane operator. He operated all kinds of heavy equipment. And so he went. He went to Russia, then returned. And in Russia, of course, he watched, uh, read the South Korean press, communicated a little with the South Koreans, and then he told his wife then that we're doing well here, what about our children? And children were leaving. Well, they had some certain savings, some connections, and they lived pretty close to the border. And they started to leave one by one. And so I believe first they sent their eldest daughter so that she could prepare for the university exams to go to the university. And then they sent, uh, usually the mother goes first. But in their case, they sent the children first and then the father. And then the mother, shortly before the COVID epidemic, locked the farm, literally put the key in her pocket and left across the border. And there, the broker was already waiting for her, and then they were off to China. Uh, are there stories like, I mean, look, when you look from the outside at North Korea and when you receive information about it through these numerous myths. Yes, there are many myths. Yeah, yeah. And it seems good to and you, bad. Yeah, it seems to you that if three people from one family escaped, then the special services are definitely aware of it and they will not allow the remaining family member to follow them. There will be an extreme surveillance on that person who will never reach well, this broker. Firstly, I repeat that uh, they are, of course, not happy with these escapes, but the escape of the pig farm owners uh, does not really bother them too much, so to speak. Moreover, let me tell you about the remaining family member. No, they will not follow him. The local security officer will periodically come to him and shake some money out of him for bribes, and this is common practice. So that the family member has no problems, he will have to constantly pay off the authorities. And so the majority of refugees come from nearby areas. So most of the 34,000 refugees are people from the border areas. And so this means that Therefore, in the border areas, so to speak, if a person goes somewhere, no one knows if he is in China or if he's in South Korea, because theoretically there is a large enough amount of illegal immigration in China. You said about the commission that could break in and check who lives where. Yes, a what, patrol. What happens if they find out that someone is spending time with a lover at that moment? This is a very big trouble. Uh, a or, trouble or a crime? No, this is not a crime. This is an administrative offense. But there is one feature. Every Korean belongs not only to a people's group, a North Korean, he belongs to an organization. This is not a working group, it is something else. Within the working group, the regular one, there are three organizations. I'll describe using Soviet standards. There is the Komsomol, the Youth Union, there is the Party, the Labour Party of Korea. And there are trade unions, but these are not our trade unions. They do not distribute vouchers. This is a somewhat simplified, more generic version of the party organization. And they hold meetings of ideological struggle there, meetings of self-criticism, lectures on the international situation in the world. Moreover, this is held three times a week, and you cannot miss it. You also have to speak once a week with self-criticism. So tell what you did to the organization. And what happens then? For example, if they pulled a lady out of her lover's bed at 2 a.m., then they reported at her place of work and at her place of residence. And accordingly, all the neighbors, all the colleagues will know about it. Uh -huh. uh, so North Korea is a country with quite puritanical morals, but this would be unpleasant in any case. Let's take the very fun Sweden, for example, right? It was probably unpleasant as in many other cases. But if they cheat, so to speak, it is definitely an unpleasant yes. And in Korea, this is very bad. Uh, will this be well, discussed in a meeting like in a Fonya movie where they did after the drunken disco well, fight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is this is like the problem is that the hypothetical comrade Kim sleeps with somebody out there, but uh, they will rather discuss the matter that this had not been registered properly. Because you can stay overnight anywhere. That's not a problem. You just have to register before 10 o'clock and you can't spend the night without registration. You have to come to this lady, the building manager, and register at her place. Then you can sleep with whoever you want. 
Initially, the same people lived there and here. It was yes, one nation. definitely, definitely. And here, they have Coca-Cola, there, they definitely. don't have it, and that's it. No. But as time went on, yes. people's diets changed. And yes. moreover, there was a hunger that yes. was absolutely yes. monstrous, taking hundreds of thousands yes. of lives. And even externally, people began to look different. How yes. true is that? This is the absolute truth. And here it is even more interesting than what you said. The thing is that when the first anthropometric measurements were made in the 1930s, they checked the average height of people since it was one nation. No one divided the country into south and north, and they divided it into three regions, the central, southern, and northern. And the borders do not coincide now, so it's not really clear how to apply this sort of information uh, to the present day statistics. Yeah. But in any case, it turns out that then the inhabitants of the south were a little shorter than the northerners by a little bit. This is understandable. The northerners historically mixed with the Mongols, with the Manchus, with these huge guys from the northern steppes, and the southerners periodically mixed with the islanders. There was a small genetic presence of both. And accordingly, it turned out that then the economic growth begins in the south, life sharply improves, people begin to eat meat, animal protein in large quantities, and well, first they get stuffed with rice, and then what happens is they eat meat and fish in huge quantities. And none of this happens in the north. As a result, the average height in the south begins to grow much more rapidly. And now, among young people, can't say for sure, but the height is something like five to six centimeters more. You mean the difference? Uh, well, yes, South Koreans are taller. You won't always recognize a separate North Korean, but a group of North Koreans will stand out for two reasons. They're shorter and they have a slightly different face and they also have a little bit of different skin because since school almost all of them except for the descendants of the richest most influential families which does not apply to them they go to various labor campaigns uh, for example, they are sent to the village to plant rice to help in the spring, and they are sent to harvest in October when all the other cities almost die out, and all of the townspeople are sent to collective farms. Well, heavy physical labor yes, in the fresh air. Yes, that yes, is. yes. So, therefore, it may even be good for health, but it's definitely not good for the skin. Oh. Are divorces permitted in North Korea? Yes, of course they're permitted, and moreover, there are very many of them quite lately. The thing is that the economic crisis from the 1990s, which led to very serious changes in the social structure of the country, so to speak, among other things, uh, led to the fact that women have a lot of economic power. Uh, so firstly, Kim Jong-un himself is a feminist. This is no joke, a real feminist. The Minister Seriously. of Foreign Affairs is a woman. Correct. And the head of his secretariat is a woman. And the role of the second vice president belongs to his sister. You could say, so what? But here's the thing. His father, Kim Jong-il, like his son, had no reliable brothers. Yeah. So the father was looking for a deputy here. And it's a tradition in the Kim family. For the time being, he was looking for a deputy. And he was his sister's husband. Absolutely right. Jung Sung Thak. Do you associate this with the fact that uh, Kim Jong-un studied in Switzerland? Well, it's not to me. This is my wife's joke, which I'm happy to quote. Kim Jong-un spent his youth in places where they began to suspect that a woman is also a human being. Mm -hmm. And this had an influence on him. Moreover, all this, what you are saying, is well known, but here are some insider information. For example, in recent years, they have quoted us, there should be a certain amount of women taking leadership positions. And we're not talking about some fictitious Supreme Council where everyone raises their hands, but in real leadership positions. There was uh, the, the regional committee among the instructors is 15% of women, like it or not, and the secretary may get punished if not compliant. So, there you have it, but this is not the main thing. The main thing is that the country has a mixed economy. The times of such super state socialism ended 30 years ago. Uh, so, in, in a country with a mixed economy, women now absolutely dominate in the private economy. Is this due to the fact that women simply, uh, uh, there's a law against parasitism yes. and everyone yes. must work? Uh, yes. A woman can register as a housewife yes. and therefore, in fact, can do business. Yes. A woman does not have to work, but a man must work. There is an option. A man can pay money. 
so-called the August 3rd contribution, that gives him the right not to work. A man can legally not work, and he will not be prosecuted for parasitism, but for this one has to pay money. This is not a bribe. One officially pays his enterprise a substantial amount of money, and sometimes many times exceeding his actual salary, in order not to go to work. And in fact, this means that he simply works in a much more profitable job at the private sector. This is not necessarily a business. One may get a good job on a private fishing boat. They pay fishermen good money there. Is it true that there are dollar millionaires in North Korea? Yes, of course, for quite some time, really. Well, this is funny, and I really love it. So when I came to Pyongyang in 2018, I was just amazed, really, at, at, at how much it changed during those few years of Kim Jong-un's rule. Okay. You said a phrase that strongly reminded me of uh, Moscow and Moscow propaganda. You said how pretty Pyongyang has become. I agree. You know, I agree with Moscow and Moscow propaganda. I don't know how long I have fallen in the eyes of our respected listeners here, but but I agree that Sibyanin's Moscow has become prettier. So, in any case, Pyongyang has also improved. Moreover, since I spent not a bad year of my youth there, I can say, well, I was in places where I used to be before, where I studied, and so I, I took a look. Well, everything was demolished. There was such not quite shabby, well, pitiful, to be honest, old houses of the, you know, from the 1950s into the 1960s. All this was demolished. Now there are very decent houses there. But where did they come from? They came from, well, um, they're there because of the private capital. This is private development. It was built by a private investor. And they said it. Uh, how much does an apartment in Pyongyang cost? Well, it depends on which one. It really depends. So, first of all, let me say right away, I will give you the prices that were there before 2020. This has definitely changed. Until about 2019, 2020, the pricing was approximately as follows. The cheapest one on the market at the time was about twenty-five to $30,000. And an apartment in a poor one-story building on the outskirts. So now probably almost all of the houses in Pyongyang have sewage and water supply, and in other cities not really, but it's in Pyongyang it's there. Although it's not sure, maybe in some places there are still none. A cheap apartment in a high-rise building, approximately 30 to 40. And everything above this, I heard about the deals for around $150,000, but of course this is an exception. A good apartment in those few new buildings and commissioning in the city center costs over $100,000 probably. A video came out a few weeks ago. A uh, Russian journalist mm -hmm. Kabeva mm -hmm. shot a video from Pyongyang, and the buildings there are Central quite impressive. Pyongyang is very beautiful. No, no, no. no. Uh, I mean, by looking at those buildings, I have a question. Who buys apartments there? Are they bought by someone, or are they distributed well, according to the nomenclature? Some part is distributed. The majority is bought. It goes like this. Look, do, do, let's say... I'm thinking how to make a million dollars in modern North Korea. Well, a million dollars, how to say, it. those who buy apartments in such buildings don't pay a million dollars. After, like I said, they I mean, there costs about $100,000 yeah. at most. And by modern standards, it may even be less. Prices have apparently reduced significantly by how much is not clear. Okay, fine. How does one earn money to buy that apartment in North Korea? Well, mainly Korea? through business, of course. There are private entrepreneurs who can afford it. And there are a certain number of highly qualified specialists, but this is rare. And besides, you can really get an apartment from the state. Usually, it goes as follows. The house is built. Uh, which means that they begin, well, first, how it was built. Let's start with that. Formerly, there was no private construction. Uh, so there was a state organization that discovers the land, negotiates on land allocation, uh, deals with initial design, although it, often it is a private individual who will deal with the design. And so the, the organization receives permission to build, say, a 25-story residential building on this site, which is good. The organization has no money. They have no experience, but it has connections and it has a seal. After that, they negotiate with people, with investors who invest money. And then they also, well, they hire qualified workers with this money, negotiate with, um, with military units. These military units can be paid with apartments that will go to officers later, or they will be sold to the military later to meet certain needs. And, you know, there is corruption, but I would not exaggerate the scale of corruption in North Korea. It exists, but it isn't that bad. So, they negotiate on the supply of reinforcement, which means, like, basic reinforcement and cement, bricks, everything that is needed. 
Well, maybe some finishing materials as well, but this is rare, and the apartments are normally sold in boxes. They are empty from the inside, and the residents usually finish them themselves. And so, these investors provide money, and a small joint stock company is formed based off of these investors. And then they begin to build. And if you want to buy an apartment, you can buy it in advance with a very big discount, because there is still a risk. But usually, it's okay. And whatever is left, what has not yet been sold during construction, they sell on the market. But not everything. So why? The organization that does this all takes some of the apartments for itself. Then the city executive committee, the people's committee today is also due to receive a certain number of them. And there are cures, and they will also receive some apartments. So a certain percentage of apartments goes to the city, a certain percentage goes to the organization. And in some cases, it happens that the authorities can also interfere. For example, and say, we need 4,000 apartments for physicists and also mathematicians and other outstanding scientists and engineers related to the missile program. And that's fine. Well, of course, then the authorities and investors have to find a way to somehow wriggle their way out. But this is a real case. They wriggled out in such a way that no one went bankrupt and the physicists moved into new apartments. Nuclear physicists, by the way. Historians are not entitled to it. Okay, but how do they become investors? How do they make so much money to become engaged in the development? Oh, uh, well, um, are they well red directors mainly it or all something? circulates around external trade. So if talking about large deals, it is mainly related to external trade. Fish, for example. So, the fish trade. So, these these old, large, uh, state-owned fishing companies, almost all of them turned out to be unviable. Large vessels, huge fishing bases, which they had, turned out to be economically unprofitable. But the small and partly medium fleet is quite viable. And it's de facto privatized, which is implied by this. So formally, this trawler or small fishing boat still belongs to the state. But in practice, it doesn't really belong to the state. A person bought it with their own money, then simply negotiated with a state organization that has the right to register fishing boats, any boats actually. But in the case of fishing boats, then the boat is registered uh, in the name and the organization, accepted by them on the balance sheet. And so the person goes fishing and pays a certain fixed amount to the state organization that agreed to put the ship on the balance sheet and returning to uh, where does the money come from question. So the first is, of course, the fish trade. The second is its minerals trade. Um, and interestingly, there are also private coal mines. So they're small, but they exist. Minerals, fish. Uh, some small enterprises working for export light industry goods. This is how they make money. Where do they keep the money? Do they have banks there? Uh, there are banks, and in general, sometimes they use them, but not very often. They use cash? Well, yes, they use cash. So practically their entire, I say, uh, mixed economy, its private sector works almost exclusively with cash. But do they have credit cards or a SWIFT yes, system? Yes, they do. And as far as I understand, there was no SWIFT system, but they do have credit cards. So they issue their own credit cards, and you can use them quite normally. I didn't use them myself, but people were using them normally in my presence. Is it possible for North Korean businessmen to spend money outside the country? Well, how can this not be possible? Of course. If they can travel abroad, and most of them have such an opportunity, then having gone abroad, they can spend the money there, which is what they do. Of course, this is a matter of everyday life. And they travel to Xinjiang very actively to buy goods. It's less common nowadays, but I do remember that 15 years ago, you could go to Xinjiang, and I met people around. You could even get acquainted with them. And they talked quite frankly about it. And how do they exchange money? Or are they using dollars? So inside the country, they use dollars. And here are two things. First, a peculiarity of Korea is... Uh, Although North Korean legislation is fierce by any standards, their monetary legislation has always been quite liberal, so much more liberal than the Soviet monetary legislation. Turn a blind eye. Uh, Yes, and they were not pursuing it. It wasn't a big deal for them. It was illegal formally. It was forbidden. But firstly, they turned a blind eye. And secondly, the punishments were not very strict. This was due to the following. In the... In the... In the late 50s, early 60s, they lured a large number of ethnic Koreans from Japan to their side, about about 90, 30,000 people. Mm. And they were told that there was a socialist paradise there. So they arrived, found out that there was no paradise, and they could not leave. They could come, but they couldn't leave. 
And they stayed there. And among other things, they were not allowed and even somehow encouraged to write letters to relatives. And then if they were to write letters to their loved ones, friends who remained in Japan, and say, send us some money, and they then began to receive quite large money transfers. So for a while, this was a very important source of foreign exchange income for North Korea, specifically the money sent from Japan to those who left. Okay, were those private transfers? No, it could have been done officially. There were offices used to receive transfers. And so requests were made in letters, but the money was transferred officially. Would they be allowed to keep the money? Why not? Uh, They just wanted to bring money into the country. Well, if you have, just to say, a cow and you want milk, would you kill it? No. Or would you rather feed it and clean it and milk it and we'll be milking it for many, many years to come? And so... Well, so that is how the money was transferred. And in order to be able to use this money, they introduced a network of stores where they accepted foreign currency. So usually, in general, they did not ask where you got your dollars from, where all of this came from. People just went there and bought whatever they needed. Uh And uh, so uh, they have very liberal monetary legislation. So going back to the original question, the country is, of course, heavily dollarized and UNIized even more. Uh, This is mainly about large transactions. So if, for example, you're buying a car or an apartment, you will pay in dollars in cash. And if you are buying, say, a motorcycle or a refrigerator, you will pay in yuan. So their local currency will be used mainly for buying uh, general goods. So theoretically, in order to somehow start a new life in China or in Europe, a North Korean businessman must take suitcases of cash with him, right? He needs to take suitcases of cash with him. How else? So how else would he be able to do it? Uh, that's the question. A lot of questions will be addressed to him. So if a person wants to flee, then usually he... Well, uh, if a person is a businessman, then the simplest option is to flee to South Korea. And if he doesn't want to, or some problems have arisen that he needs to wind up his business in North Korea, then, well, the only way for him to go is to go south. I mean, where else? In principle, one may wait out in China, and I know people who have lived in China for a long time in some kind of unclear, semi-legal status, some even settled legally, but but I'm afraid that that's impossible now because they settled legally in the 90s, in the early 2000s, in the early 2000s, uh, when there was no electronic control system in China yet. So now I think it'll be much harder. Who does the world react to a North Korean passport? Uh, can well, they don't to enter react countries? really well. They get nervous. Uh, And uh, in many cases, even the very fact of visiting North Korea means that you'll have to explain the reason. And this happened to me very, well, several times. And so if they see a North Korean visa in your passport, in some countries they will ask, what were you doing there? What sort of business did you have? So uh, they don't really react really well. Can a North Korean get a Schengen visa? Uh, I don't know. I think so. I can't think of anything. I think so. Just uh, the thing is, everything is possible. It's just difficult. And so if they don't react well, this doesn't mean that they throw you out of the consulate window. But, so to speak, there will be a lot of problems, more than other passport holders may face. Let's imagine that right now, while we're filming, uh, someone wants to move in this direction in a small boat. So what will the South Korean border guards do? Wait a minute, Uh, this person must be completely crazy because the boat will be noticeable. Everything is visible from both sides. And the North Koreans will open fire if you mean to. We'll be rooting for him. We'll We'll support him. him, But his boat will sink and the North Korean border guards will shoot him in two minutes. You know what I mean? In two minutes. And this place is well swept and there are guard posts. If he somehow makes it over here, if some sort of divine intervention happens, then the South Koreans will try to quickly drag him somewhere on a boat. No, if, if someone swims, I mean, there are cases, recently there was one, but they swim on their own, uh, on their own. I don't know, breaststroke, crawl, I don't know, but on their own. Without boats. And you said before that North Koreans have to deserve the right to even come close to the water. It's more complicated, not just to come close to the river, but the right to live in this area. And so you are thoroughly checked beforehand. Real people live in there, but in order to get the right to live there, you have to go through a huge number of checks. But no, I mean, in general, there there must be beaches there, uh, right? Oh, beaches. Ah, I understand what you mean. So close to the sea, that's another matter, so to speak. The sea in North Korea has been fenced off for a very long time, since the 1960s. There are two rows of barbed wire and a footprint control ship between them. Interestingly enough, they fenced off 
about the sea when their border was not yet engineered. So this level of border security, structures on the border of this level, were built at the very end of the 2010s. I believe the 2010s, yes. The seacoast fences are there since the 1960s. Why so? They also feared the inception of South Korean intelligence groups, which was the case back then. And then spy planes appeared, or then there became less intelligence groups, if any remained at all. And of course, North Korean defectors. Therefore, a person simply cannot approach the significant part of the North Korean coast at all. And that is only unless he is a border guard. These are certain sections. Yes, there are beaches. There are designated areas where anyone can really go to take a walk or swim or fish. And of course, there is a guard. All of this is clearly marked. And the majority of their shoreline is blocked. Well, in one of our previous episodes, one of our guests mentioned that he made a gift for his girlfriend on her 20th birthday, a yes. trip to North Korea. And when they went to the beach, there was a machine gunner yes, nearby. Is that true? Of course, it's true. So the beach, the beach that a person can go to... Well, this beach is a limited area. I don't know. 90% of the length of the coastline, even 95% is a limited area. I don't know. But most of it is closed off, and you cannot just go there at all. So or let's say a port. If it's a fishing port, there is a guard post, and you have to show relevant documents if you approach it. You can't just come and walk around the port territory because there are ships there and you can try sailing abroad on one of the ships. Well, it's kind of sad. Well, it's sad. You can't even have some fun. Well, they have fun in other ways. In that video Skabeva shot about North Korea recently, she says that there was no military official walking by her. Uh, She said, I walk without any surveillance. Well, she made that up. Maybe that's her job to make things up a little bit or so. Or maybe they decided to create a situation, so to speak. And moreover, I believe that they checked her anyway and considered her to be a reliable person, Uh probably. Because there was actually a guy appearing in some shots. Well, no. No, of course. Of course, any foreigner will be followed. Uh, Moreover, there are always two guides assigned to you. So one guide from the travel company, the other from the state security. And moreover, it's funny, since they assume that a foreigner cannot read Korean, if a tourist can read Korean, then they can try to read any official documents that they can find lying around, and it will say, this guide is provided by the travel company, and this is a guide from the state security. (laughs) Uh, So normally state security guides are quite athletic and don't really talk so much. And the guides from... uh, Uh, They don't recruit women in the state security, by the way. Why? Well, it's a tradition. Maybe due to the rise in feminism, but let's say they haven't been recruiting women for a very long time. What about um, honey traps or honey Well, she doesn't have to be an officer for that. First of all, those stories are, although no, in fact, such a story actually occurred recently, so it happens. Uh, But in any case, she doesn't uh, need to be an officer to do that. You can outsource external personnel for this, as by the way they normally do. But you see, there's another case currently in going in South Korea. A South Korean businessman who supplied various software for state organizations came under them under the investigation, and he was supplying something related to cyber cybersecurity or something like that. And it turned out that he had a North Korean girlfriend, a waitress. They met when she worked in Myanmar, and then there were a lot of Korean restaurants there. One of the ways to make money is is North Korean restaurants. And then while she was in Myanmar, she... In Myanmar, uh, you mean in the country? Yes, yes, in the country. There was the North Korean restaurant. Then when all of these unfortunate sanctions were imposed, the, the, the restaurant was closed and they moved somewhere else. And as a result, not immediately, they ended up in Dundalk. And so he constantly traveled there, communicated with her restaurant and so on. Like some sort of like, um, like, a, like a sugar daddy. A man in his 50s. And now they're trying to figure out what was the case. Why that happened. Maybe he passed on some secrets there or maybe not. I don't know. But what was the problem? It was just an affair. Well, a person who has access to South Korean state secrets is having an affair with a North Korean waitress and going to a restaurant where there's definitely a representative of the North Korean special services who naturally would be tracking all of this. Moreover, even the very fact that the girl worked for seven years at a restaurant proves that a special decision had to have been made. The North Korean Special Services needed this man. I'm sorry, one more time. It all happened outside of South Korea. All of this happened outside of South Korea, in Ah. countries of Southeast and East Asia. Well, okay. 
then it makes sense. So there was this thing I asked you about North Korean on a boat and what would the border guards do if they saw him. Personally, every story that you tell about a runaway North Korean and an attempt to imagine a hypothetical situation about the boat <laughs> would make me want to support the person, to root for them and be happy for them. Is it the same for South Koreans? Yes, rather the same, I'd say. Yes. So so I'd say at the same time, the, the relationships are complex. That is, a specific person arouses sympathy. In general, the desire to accept North Koreans is not very great, but it is perceived, well, as it should be. But in the North Korean, I mean, the South Korean authorities strive to ensure that this flow is not very large at all. And so, but now, after North Korea is closed off, and most importantly, China is closed too, through which very many people people fled, the problem has become much less acute. So now the flow is simply decreasing because the current leadership of the North perceives the problem of defectors as serious, very serious. Under Kim Jong-il, it was generally ignored, but Kim Jong-un in general, having lived and studied abroad for a very long time, I mean, in Switzerland. he grew up, a, yes, in Switzerland, he knows all of this and he understands how useful it is for the people not to know or how harmful it is to know too much. And he tries to block these flows of people. And uh, accordingly, the problem is not as acute as it used to be. At one time, the South Korean government, of course, did a lot of the background to make it a little bit harder for defectors to come. And that's why they would then go through China. But you didn't ask, you didn't ask the question that is often asked, but if they were in China, then why can't they go to the South Korean embassy and just ask for help? Well, they can't. Seriously. Of course, they could come, but they wouldn't receive much help unless they are some particularly valuable personnel. But if you are a colonel from Kim Jong-un's guard, you will receive it, of course. But if you're a lady who has a pig farm, then no. But this is about China. And can you get that yes, sort of help yes, in Thailand? Yes, 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 because the official explanation, which is 50% true, is that China does not want to become a transit hub uh -huh. And if the South Koreans would actively use their representative offices, not just embassies, any representative offices in China to smuggle refugees from the north, then it will cause dissatisfaction amongst the Chinese citizens. This is 50 percent true. And the other 50 percent is about like, making it more difficult. Like get to other neighboring the, countries. Get to Mongolia, yes. They also go through Mongolia, but mainly through Thailand, correct? In the last century, there was this controversy when uh, North Korea kidnapped a South Korean director. Yes, yes, yes. They yes. wanted to build their own Hollywood Yes, there. there was this case. Where did his life end? I in South Korea, not so long ago. No, he died a long time ago. His wife died not so long ago. But in the end, they escaped. And they, as it were, gained trust and had an official trip to Europe approved. And from there, they escaped back to where they were. In principle, kidnapping is a very serious matter. You know, there was a case when the Soviet ambassador, having received instructions from the Gromyko, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, uh, burst into Kim Il-sung's residence at 10 o'clock in the evening and demanded that Kim Il-sung stop this outrage. And this happened after the North Korean Special Services kidnapped a North Korean citizen in the middle of Moscow, who by at that time had received political asylum in the USSR. Oh. Yes. Well, there were such cases. And these aberrations happened a few times. Uh, has there been anything like this in recent years? Well, uh, at least there have been nothing major. This was common in the 1950s and 1960s. And besides, there were always some controversies with lumberjacks. There were Korean workers whom they want to take out for one reason or another. Such things happened constantly. They usually did not really attract any attention. And I don't know, perhaps, so to speak, uh, Russian or rather Soviet authorities had this information, but it also did not really evolve into a scandal. We now know that Korea is very beautiful in the fall. Yes, traditional maple blossoming seasoning, or rather a leaf fall. Red maples usually signify the beginning of mountain strip season. Yeah, and uh, to be honest, these leaves make Canadian maples jealous. Yes, uh, yes, these are our maples. Yeah, we know big. how to grow maples properly. Uh, we're on the territory of the campus of the university where you teach. Yes, Kunmin University. 15,000 students. The campus is small, but all Korean universities have fairly small campuses. Well, except perhaps Seoul. There is quite a large one because it is on the outskirts. The land is expensive. After all, that's a city center. And you're hosting a lecture well, right now. Well, yes, yes. We finish here and then... Uh, what will this the lecture be about? The history of Korean urban life is the subject. And today's specific topic is North Korea. The subject is mainly about South Korea, but today's lecture is about uh, North Korean cities from the Korean War to the death of Kim Il-sung. 
that it's a Pyongyang was being built, which are what its features are, and it will show a little bit of the visuals there. Well, just not too much, obviously. I just didn't have time to prepare properly. I need to prepare better next time. So I will be telling about the features of a North Korean city in comparison to the South Korean one. And you'll read the lecture in Korean. Yes, in Korean. Until recently, no other language worked well here. Uh, for some reason, people go to South Korea thinking that they can use English language. Well, the younger generation speaks English more or less, but otherwise, a typical student of our university reads in English, of course. Yes, they read pretty well. Any person with a higher education reads in English, and this is the majority of the population amongst the youth. But they also they read tolerably, but they do not speak in English, and they don't comprehend it by ear. They have problems with this. Let's go back to North Korea. Uh, so you've said more than once that they have good education Yeah, there. but for such a poor country, can't stress this enough, taking into account that their per capita GDP, according to their own data, is $1,300, then for such a poor country, it is simply wonderful. 100% literacy, approximately 15% of the population studies at universities, and so on. And how does this line up with the number of absolutely meaningless subjects that they well, teach? Well, it's because there aren't that many of them. And so this is a little bit of an anti-North Korean and propaganda meme. And uh, I, hold sir, on, I'm quoting your book. Because uh, no. in your book, well, it, it depends says, on how you look at it. So they spend time on these subjects, but there are few subjects. More precisely, there are many subjects, but not so much time is allocated oh. to those specific ones. And if you look at all of these logical subjects, it is 10. Well, from 10 to 20 percent of the study time, well, that's a lot. But 80 to 90 percent of the subjects are mathematics, foreign languages, and others like physics and chemistry. They also study their own history, but the history they study is something like, we are the greatest in the world, the best nation in the world, we always defeated everyone, and in general, everyone looks at us with envy. So, they kind of study this type of history and literature as well. But, but natural sciences are taught pretty well. In the DPRK, they teach foreign languages. Not just teach, but it's a very prestigious thing. And they're generally a mandatory part of the school curriculum in university, but just, it's just... What are these languages? Is it Chinese or English? Well, English, of course. Primarily English. And now Chinese is also prestigious. But moreover, private foreign language classes is a good business for them. So if you are a good English or Chinese language tutor, then it's very good. You will earn quite a lot of money. You can be sure of that. What does North Korean internet look like? Oh, well, they have their own internal network. It is called Kwang Kim Yang. And for some reason, they almost stopped using this name now, but it's very rarely heard. Well, I don't know. In general, they use their own internet. It is, well, it's quite developed, but it is physically not connected in any way with the big internet. This is all internal, purely internal networks. And as far as I understand, I'm not a great specialist in technologies, but they use standard internet protocols, and all of the software products are standard there. But it is actually physically separated from the World Wide Web as we know it. Uh, but what's in there? I mean, well, there are forums, there are interest groups, there are websites of organizations, websites, uh, so to speak, of local press websites, and so on. It's all there at emails. Well, they have it. It's there. But an email from it's, their domain cannot go to Gmail, can't. for example. Uh huh. No, it does. It's Gmail. It can't go anywhere. Well, speaking the about country leaders, can Kim Jong Un watch YouTube? Well, country leaders do do that. People with power, so to speak, they do have access to the regular World Wide Web. So, well, people with whom you sometimes have to talk, they know all of this perfectly. Well, of course they do. But in principle, any computer with big internet is located at a governmental facility. So just to make it clear for you, again, uh, this information is about four or five years old. However, it is unlikely to have changed. Uh, that is, if you have an email box, what does that mean? This does not mean that you come to work, turn on the computer and check your email box. You do have a computer and you check your email box, but this will be an internal one, country-wise email network. It contains emails from your colleagues and so on. And But if you have external access, you come to a special room, and then at the entrance to this room, there is a personnel officer sitting. You sign in the journal that you came to check your email at 10.45 a.m. You turn on the computer. And then it, it connects to the bigger network that is internal. You look through the email box, you download whatever you need, and, well, moreover, they don't let you linger there. They watch to make sure that you are looking through your email box, not surfing the, any websites. 
and then you prepare some replies. Now, by the way, this is one of the reasons why it is often quite difficult to exchange emails with them, because they do not have instant access, even if a person just has an international email address, basically. And so if he is permitted to use all of this, then he needs some sort of time to get back to the governmental facility to be able to use the computer connected to the bigger internet that they use, the internal one. You mentioned that there's an application installed on all personal computers, yes, so you which can screenshot when you're watching at any moment. So from time to time, so to speak, it is random, as I understand it, as programmers might say, it's a random selection. From time to time, they take screenshots. So this is based on Lemarks, although they have reworked it. So they, of course, say that they, this is their own creation, but come on, they say this about everything that they have there. For example, their mobile phones, which are really either just Chinese with Korean logos glued onto them or assembled using Chinese components back home and, and so on. Uh, but um, a mechanical assembly, so to speak, they keep saying that they made it, but in fact, it's Lemarks. But among the various additional features that they have first added there, two functions are very important here. First, this program does not allow you to open up text files and audio files that contain, um, that, excuse me, uh, on the contrary, does not have any electronic signature of competent organizations here. So, meaning you can't go to your classmate and say, give me your complete math assignments that you have, because it will not open up for you if your computer is running on this system, Red Star, Bulgin Bill. While... So this is the first feature. And secondly, they periodically take screenshots and then keep them and you cannot delete them. And all the computers are registered and they should also all be checked periodically. Do they do it to make sure you're not watching South Korean movies, for example? Yes, yes, or yes. Something and of course, from the most the intolerable market. thing is foreign films for them, especially South Korean ones. What is worse, watching South Korean movies or uh, watching porn? A porn is worse you'll be in big trouble for watching porn. So you will get in trouble for watching South Korean movies as well. Uh, not that uh, like harsh, what? but still. Imprisonment or no, administrative not. penalty? So these talks about the fact that someone was shot five times with dog throwers for watching a James Bond film are, of course, nonsensical. But I guess if you were to have gotten caught on this, then, of course, it will be reported to your employer. You will have some big problems and you... Uh, well, in the worst case, you could even lose your job and you can be evicted from Pyongyang, which is in even a worse condition for you. But this is an extreme case, I would say. In general, there will be trouble. And if you shoot these films, if you make copies of them, then you can certainly get yourself into prison. Well, this makes you a dealer. Yes, if you were a dealer or traded them. If you just watch it, then theoretically this is also, I suppose, a criminal case. But to be honest, I have practically never heard of situations in which people were really imprisoned for this. Theoretically, you could get sued for this, but practically everything is limited to administrative and service penalties. But this is serious. Nobody wants this. What can make you end up in prison? Well, I don't know. If you hijack someone on the streets, it's possible. If talking about politics, well, let's say... Uh, um, uh, any critical remarks to the authorities and especially to the first family, yes, you will definitely get into prison for this. If you have any conversations that sort of cast doubt on any official features of propaganda, then this as well. Were there any such cases recently? Recently? Uh, well, n now I'm trying to remember what I've heard recently. Uh... We live worse than pigs, a man said. Ah, yes, by the way, there were two similar cases. We live worse than pigs here. Uh, that's what he said. Well, uh, and that's it. Uh, what was his sentence? Well, I don't know. I, I just don't It know. was imprisonment. His imprisonment. Right? Imprisonment, by all means. And, uh, well, in any offensive statements about the system are bad for you. Uh, did he say that in private in conversation? Private, yes, but there are informants everywhere. So there's always someone listening. So they're reported to the authorities. Are denunciations common in uh, North Korea? Denunciations is a common practice. There is an old standard uh, originating in 2010s that there, out of 50 people, well, so for the police security, it was calculated uh, that out of 50 people, uh, there should be at least one informant. So, But this sprungly depends. Really. So it is clear that in some important facility, I don't know, uh, perhaps among missile engineers or the journalists uh, over at uh, Nodak Simon, there will be many times more informants. And in some remote collective farm, well, much less, probably. There you go. Do people report on their family members? 
Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to remember if I know of any specific cases, as they say in the West. Well, I think that theoretically they do, but practically I can't remember. The family still remains a very strong institution in North Korea. Not as strong as before, but still very strong. Here's a quote from your book. Children in kindergarten are constantly reminded that only thanks to the Kim mm-hmm. family they can enjoy their happy yeah, childhood. Yeah. Even the food they eat in kindergarten represents evidence of the wisdom and kindness of the great leader. Mm-hmm. Therefore, after each meal, all children mm-hmm. must thank the leader for taking care of them, bowing to his portrait and chanting in chorus, Great leader, thank you for the food. Yes, there was a special Korean formula. If you went to a restaurant with someone and the person paid for you, this means that he fed you. This is a special formula that they use. This is also applied in kindergarten. So a child were to eat, then bows to the leader saying, thank you, leader, for feeding me. And if someone paid for you in a restaurant, Well, then you thank the person who paid for you. It was not the great leader who paid in the restaurant. It was he who pays. Why thank him? But since it is believed that the food in school or in kindergarten is provided by the leader, then accordingly, you need to say thank you to the great leader. Yes, it is the great leader who paid for the food in kindergartens. Aren't parents paying for the food in kindergarten by paying uh, taxes? In North Korea. Or the Korea. tuition fee uh, if, if this is a private kindergarten? Uh, what, private, what, what private kindergartens? No, no, actually, they do exist. No, no, but no. I just um, think, uh, right now I'm talking about how I see well, it. Well, let me explain how it works in North Korea. Well, firstly, private kindergartens in North Korea actually do exist. So little that it's insignificant. And secondly, what taxes? Until recently, they said there are no taxes in our country at all. There really were no taxes there for a very long time. And now they, no. they've showed up again. And so, well, taxes. Taxes. Well, taxes, I don't know, but everybody pays taxes. But the leader is so good that he provides food in the kindergartens, and you need to thank him for that. So, yes, absolutely right. And so, if we talk about all of these rituals, these mandatory rituals of worshiping portraits of the leader, all of this does exist. Remember the story that there was a fire and, say, uh, a girl died saving the leader's portrait from the burning school. For this, they did awarded her teacher, her parents, and the school principal. Uh-huh. Yes. The, the problem is how much time is spent on this and how much time they study mathematics. They study mathematics a lot, too. So you claim that all these idolatrous subjects, those meaningless subjects, are compensated by the fact that they study mathematics at, conditionally speaking, the Soviet level. They study it about the Soviet level, yes. They, they primarily adopted Soviet programs. But taking into account the fact that the level of diligence is significantly higher, I would say maybe even better than the Soviet level. That is, they adopted Soviet programs. And on the other hand, in the provinces, it's probably worse because there is such a problem that the chances of further advancement are, well, if you are a very capable person from the province, even if you have had a bad file, that is, your great-grandfather did something wrong, your your grandfather, for example, I don't know, was a landlord, for example, then... Then in this case, since the end of the 90s, the setting is that with such a bad file, you can almost do nothing. But if you are very good at mathematics and physics, if you are very good at them, you can still enter a good specialized technical university just for this. Just like Jews in the Soviet Union. Well, you could say that, yes. Yeah, like extra efforts are needed to basically... Well, well, probably, probably so. But the problem is that extra efforts must be clearly directed to this physics and mathematics oh. direction. And so people, well, besides these guys, probably now in the provinces they study worse, but everybody still goes to school. Everybody gets some sort of an education. You said that in the DPRK there are programmers and designers. Yes, programmers are especially good. I have read about mm, hackers from DPRK. Uh, where do they come from, given that there's basically no internet in the well, country? Well, in order to teach them, they get access to the internet. The thing is that uh, I should say that now a lot is being said about North Korean hackers, right? In in general, I heard about their appearance not from the Western press, but from Russian cybersecurity specialists. Well, for personal reasons... I know some people from old times, and they started telling me a long time ago, more than 10 years ago, the North Koreans keep popping up on our radar, and then it all just sort of went public, all of it. Kaspersky Lab, if we talk about Russian specialists, uh-huh. it has spoken about his several times, and they do appear from time to time. But, well, they are constantly trying to get into my computer, but that's normal. When they don't get into my computer, but they do get into my colleague's computer, I kind of feel offended by that. I think that probably I'm working badly, 
They uh-huh. don't appreciate it since they don't even try and to What does it me. look like? I mean, how are they raised? How? No, no, I mean. Through phishing emails as usual. No, no, no. I mean, how hackers oh, are raised. That's what you mean. How? Well, well, firstly, they have several quite good training centers and they have a, a good technical level. So, so they just recruit students at technical universities no. and then. So, first they teach and then they recruit. And there, apparently, they are trained further, and they work in hacking centers, which, by the way, these centers are physically not located in North Korea. But, for example, for a very long time ago, one of the largest centers was located in this medium-sized hotel in the city of Shenyang, where they, in fact, lived more or less without going outside at all. But in groups under the supervision of a personal officer, they could go into a cafe or to the market or a shop. And that's basically how they lived there, and they were hacking everything uh, that they had access to. So I assume that such centers continue to exist in different countries around the world. Well, mainly in East and Southeast Asia. Are the languages different now? Uh, I mean, a difficult question. For example, let's take a South Korean student who's now walking around the campus. Uh, will he easily understand a North Korean student? Uh, I mean, language-wise. Uh, no, the pronunciation is not the problem. The North Korean student will speak strangely. From a South Korean point of view, the North Korean student will speak strangely, articulate words in a weird way, uh, use some sort of strange expressions, not quite understandable or very old. No one speaks like that for 50 years already, and that's pretty much it. The other way around is more difficult. And yes, if they start talking in some sort of technical terms, I suppose, then we, then yes, of course, they will face some problems The other way well. around, you mean but, North Korean will not understand Yes, there South is Korean. in the automotive facility not far from here. If, for example, two car builders meet, and I mean students who specialize in car design, then they may have some serious mutual misunderstanding because South Korean terminology is in English, almost all of it, in, in, in English, and a little bit of Japanese. And North Korean terminology is in Chinese for the most part, and also in Japanese a little bit. Do they have a local car brand in North Korea? Well, like their it's own version of Fuzz. No, they took Soviet. Uh, uh, after all, uh, North Korea began producing cars earlier than South Korea at the end of the 1950s, I want to say, but not passenger cars. And so they tried several times to make their own passenger cars. Uh, there were several attempts. There were so-called Pictusans automobiles, but they did not work well. They were produced in small series in significant amounts. Uh, now used for exhibition purposes mainly, and then one South Korean company opened a joint production of cars at Pyongwa. And so these are passenger cars, which in general were first copied from Italian brands, and now they're replicating some sort of Chinese model. Uh, can you actually drive it? You can. It? I mean, it's quite regular. Although I think that now with all of this sanctions and everything, production has actually stopped because the South Koreans left. And the plant itself, the production is minimal, so most of the cars that drive around the streets of Pyongyang are, of course, Chinese cars. Cars from China. I have read that, um, again, it may be a myth or a rumor or whatever. When Kim Jong-un wants food from McDonald's, a plane flies from Pyongyang to one of the Chinese cities and flies back with Big Mac combo on board. Well, you know, of course, I would not be surprised if this were actually the case. It is known that his father, a great lover of French wines and Swiss cheese, all of this was brought to him by special flights, so maybe it is. But I would, to be honest, treat this with great skepticism, because who knows? This happens. In North Korea, this happens. And women, members of the Kim family, flew on special shopping trips in the 90s. This, all of this happened. But in general, for me, it sounds like an exaggeration. I can't vouch for it, but it looks like a propaganda hoax. So, Kim Jong-un, you said that his exact date of birth is unknown. He was born on January 8th. The date is known. The year but remains unclear. most likely he was born in 1982. Well, approximately, yes. Most likely, yes. 1982, 84, the beginning of the 1980s, yes. Mm. Uh, he studied in Switzerland. Yes. How is that possible? Well, that the son of a dictator... We're talking about the Kim family, and there are several dozen of Kims. This is a very family that has been ruling for over 70 years already, or almost 80, actually, I believe is what it is. Or, well, yeah, it's probably closer to 80. And which I think can easily hold power for another 100 years for sure. So in this family, precisely in the 90s, there was such a... There was such a trend to receive a Western education. Not only did he study there, there, of course, they all studied under false names, of course. And we don't really know who studied where exactly, but at least several more reliable cases are known when young people from 
These specific families either studied in the West in general, or they lived and interned there for a long time. How did this work from a technical standpoint? There was a football player from North Korea in Wings of the Soviets yes. Football Club in Samara, and he lived with some guy who obviously yes. was a North Korean uh, KGB officer. officer. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, how prince, did who Kim study prince. without any... Formerly, uh, Kim Jong-un was the son of an embassy employee. So the ruling family sent the relatives there, minor members of the family who watched over him, and that's what they did. Well, I suppose that's how. Uh, but that's it. And it was okay for Switzerland to educate the son of a dictator? Uh, well, no, not a dictator. There was no such specialization there. The man went to study in high school, and then he studied in the senior school. That, well, that's it. But of course, among those who pay for such a school, there are children of specialists in mass executions and to dictators, and there are also children of other types of people. Of course, it is what it is. In Switzerland, in general, a few entities ask where the money comes from if you're willing to pay. Switzerland has always been famous for the fact that these questions are not asked, which is why it's so loved. Uh, what do we know about the Kim family? Oh, well, we know that his wife, whom he is in very love with, uh, they have two or three children. It's unclear, most likely three, but it's not very clear. The daughter, Kim Joo-ae, became very public since November of 2022. And it's it's kind of quite interesting. Clearly, she is the heiress. Well, a candidate for the heiress. She's just 11 years old, and it's still a bit early. Uh, a cute little girl, a little chubby, just like her dad and mom. And so he goes with her to various official events, moreover, usually to military events. He takes her either to a military plant or to observe for a missile launch. He takes his daughter to work all the time. His daughter goes to work with her father. But there is an interesting, right now there's a completely traditional official iconography now. They sit together, all three of them. Sometimes it's just Kim Jong-un with his daughter. Sometimes it's he and his wife. But I, I say again, he and his wife have very good relationships. And he is the first North Korean leader to show his wife to the public. Because Kim Il-sung's wife, she had a reputation, but it is posthumous. During her lifetime, oh. she remained behind the curtain. And in general, her promotion began when her son was made heir, and it was related to this. And Lee Soju, literally, well, Lee Soju, that's how we write her name according to the established tradition, because neither North nor South Koreans pronounce the surname Lee like that, but it doesn't matter. And so they write her name as Lee Soju. And accordingly, Lee Soju was, so to speak, uh, demonstrated to the city and to the world literally in the first months of Kim Jong-un's rule in the summer in July 2012, which is when it was. Uh, so here is the usual iconography. Kim Jong-un sits with his wife, Lee Sol-ju, and the girl Kim ju ae sits between them. And in the back, there are generals standing in attention, dressed in military uniforms with military decorations, and they're very fond of military decorations in North Korea. Generals always love wearing them publicly. Uh, moreover, when the daughter takes part in some sort of military event, there is a slogan here. At the cost of our lives, we will protect our bloodline. So, as if the dynasty, the family, the hereditary line of Mount Paek II. It is formally believed that Kim Jong-un's father was born down at Hwarisk, but on Mount Paek II. And so, this is such a sacred mountain on the border with China, the border runs along it, in, in fact. So, when, when the girl is there, the slogan says, protect Mount Paek II. And when the girl is not there, uh, they do not talk about protecting Mount Paek II. Uh, so, obviously, the young princess is growing up. She's clearly the successor. Uh, should we trust the news about Kim executing the unwanted generals? Well, he certainly ordered executions. In some cases, we have nearly precise, uh, precise confirmations. So, no execution has been confirmed, but people have been disappearing. What happens next? They reissue old photographs. Any disappeared general also disappears from the photographs. Same as with Stalin's yes. photos. Yes, so this is a common North Korean practice. There are specialists. Historians mainly are interested in this. Well, only one of my former graduate students also loves it as much as I do, but he knows this topic very well. So what do they check? They look at how photographs are published, and so they see the certain person has disappeared it and has never reappeared. This person disappeared, and then after 40 years, he appeared in the photographs again, and that means that he was posthumously rehabilitated. There was another case. Uh, there was another lady who were clearly belonged to Soviet intelligence who was a big figure in North Korea. And so uh, she was rehabilitated, as it seems, but she did not appear in the photographs. This means that she was not fully rehabilitated. 
It's natural. First, five people stand in the photograph, then four, three, two, and eventually it's just Kim Il-sung. What can a general be shot for? Uh, well, if he's considered dangerous. The thing is that in the beginning, they talked a lot about shootings, disappearances and executions and shootings. I am inclined to think that there were many real shootings there, and there were expulsions from posts somewhere, uh, to the village, to a lady, to the backwoods, far from home. So all sorts of things happened, I would say. So why do you ask? But here was another interesting point. There was a strange game he played during the first years of his rule until about 2017 or so. Uh, Kim Jong-un constantly changed people in key positions, namely security officials in key posts. He carefully monitored that a person did not occupy one major position for long, if this was a security official. So this did not apply to the economic sector, but namely to the security officials, so that a person would not occupy one position for too long. For example, during the first decade of his rule, the Ministry of Defense held his position for an average of 10 months. Every 10 months, as there was a new Minister of Defense in the country. And so this does not mean that the previous one was shot, no, but this means that he was no longer the Minister of Defense and they transferred him to somewhere else. And for comparison, this is not a tradition at all. During his father's and grandfather's reign, the term of service of the Minister of Defense was an average of 10 years. And during Kim Jong-un's first years of rulership, it was 10 months, and so now it's not that harsh. He was apparently afraid of some discontent in the military environment and perhaps a coup. And he was a young guy. For the military, who were primarily as old as his father, or rather his grandfather, for them, he was someone unfamiliar. And who knows what they might have come up with, so he was ensuring himself. So someone who was considered especially dangerous, maybe someone who talked uh, too much while drunk or sober, or maybe even those who were indeed scheming behind his back, all of them were just suffered repressions. And I don't really believe in this very much, but I cannot fully exclude this possibility. Are ordinary people executed in North Korea. Of course they were executed. Of uh, course they're executed. For what? For anything. They are executed for serious political affairs. This is the basis of the matter. But also any for any criminal offense. Even for, um, in olden times, uh, uh, they could have been executed for killing a bull or a cow. This may sound scary, but it's not scary. The thing is that it, it's understandable. The, the country is very underdeveloped. And if you kill a cow there, then you condemn the village not to hunger, but to hard times for many of the other people. It's very difficult for them. Uh, the whole world was shocked by photos of an execution in yes. Iran when a person was basically hanged on a pole. Mm -hmm. uh, when was the last time something similar happened in North well, Korea? They, have, they make decisions themselves. So sometimes they make decisions about public executions, and then sometimes they don't. When was the last time public executions took place, you ask, quite a long time ago. But I would say for about 10 years, I have not heard reports of public executions at all. So what this happens is, this happens in batches. Say they conducted an execution campaign. Then it was quiet. By the way, an important point. I have not heard of a single public execution for political crimes. Only criminal offense? Only for serious criminal offense. Mm -hmm. uh, first degree murders, for example. Let's go back a bit. I asked this in the backstage. Oh, uh, is it the defectors who dramatize this? Yes, not without a reason. When a single defector tells about someone being shot somewhere, I'm always like, well, I'll take it into account. I'll put a check mark, but I won't repeat the story myself until several independent sources confirm this. Because too often, it's just pure fantasy, is what it is. And this is a common problem with defectors, because first of all, a person wants to attract attention to himself, and secondly, he hates the regime. You have to understand this. Clearly, there are many reasons for that, too. And the person begins to tell all sorts of horrors, and moreover, horrors that are well sold to the South Korean public, mainly, and the Western public. But the West is not very interested in them, uh, primarily to the South Korean public, I would say. Therefore, I would be very careful about what they say. You know what they say. How should we treat the news that some North Korean generals were actually uh, fed to dogs? But this is such a wonderful fake. Come on, don't you know the story of this wonderful fake? Oh, uh, tell me. The story is absolutely marvelous. So it all started uh, with this satirical blog that they have in China. Just like The Onion. Well, like, absolutely. The Onion. The Chinese The Onion reported the generals were fed to dogs. Uh, moreover, no one noticed for a month. I mean, come on. It's the local The Onion, a funny blog with many subscribers. But... But after a month after the publication, a second-rate publication picked this up, which either did not understand what it was dealing with. Well, basically, they posted it as real news with a link to the original source on the Chinese The Onion website, meaning if something was published in The Onion, it becomes viral in two months. It's, it's quite funny. Uh, Do they have a gulag system in North Korea? 
Of course, of course they do. What does it look like? Well, in terms of political camps, by the way, there is a completely standalone system of political camps there, which distinguishes this from most countries, for example, from the Soviet Union. Their criminals and political prisoners are kept completely separate. So, moreover, even different names are used for them. A camp for political prisoners and a camp for criminals are called by different words. They are numbered, but gradually they're becoming bigger and bigger each year for 40 years already. And so the total number, uh, thanks to the fact that the location of all these camps is very well known, that is, or rather their precise locations are known thanks to the satellite images, it is possible to eliminate the total number of imprisoned people, the people that are in the camps. And... I should say that over the past 25, 30 years approximately, it has significantly decreased, while in some cases by more than two times. Uh, what was the approximate well, 80 number? 80 to 90,000 was the last ep- estimate, but again, this is the years 2015, 2016. Uh, so what happens now is these estimates are not calculated about annually. There are from time to time someone sits down and starts counting. Well, the last estimates are about 80,000, maybe 80 to 90,000. In most cases, these are people who uh, disapprove the regime. Uh, yes. Are there also yes. people who ended up in prison well, of course, for telling primarily jokes? Primarily, those are people who were in prisons for telling jokes to a large extent. Until the beginning of the 2000s, uh, the principle of family responsibility existed there. Um, and this was, in effect, when this was under Kim Il Sung and Kim Jong Un rolled this all back. Not at once, but in several stages. And the principle means that if a person committed a political crime, then All members of the families of the one accused of high treason, as they said in the Soviet times under Stalin's rule, all people who are registered at that address, that is, who have the same registration, all these people had to be sent to the labor camp. All of these people. And so then they all had to stay there either until his death or until the end of his sentence. But the conditions in those camps for the family members of a traitor to the motherland were significantly better than in the camps for regular, ordinary political prisoners. Quite a lot of people survived. And then they were able to be released. And some of them later ended up abroad. Some of them told about their past. Not everyone, though. And the number of people uh, whose names are known is perhaps a third of all who were really in those camps. Uh, I mean, in those camps for family members. During the 2014 World Cup, a North Korean national team qualified, and uh, there were news that the North Korean TV uh, showed that the Korean national team made it to the finals, although they didn't even make it out of the group. They kept losing. Of course, it's not true. It's not true. Uh, North Koreans, if there are any unpleasant moments, usually they decide not to talk about them at all. So now during the Asian Games, when they had been winning, they wrote about this a lot. And when they lost, they either did not write about it or mentioned it briefly. And this is another one of those funny stories that they tell about uh, North Korea, that they're able to talk about the country. Meaning if they're losing, they wouldn't say it as no. if it was a draw no. or, so or even a win. Either they will briefly mention it or they will not mention it at all. The second option is more likely, but they will not make it up. Have you seen videos where Kim Jong-un casts from the shore yes, on a yes, boat yes, yes, and yes. people cry? Yes. Uh, what was it? Well, they were told to cry and they did. What would you expect? That's propaganda for you. When when seeing Kim Jong-un or Kim Il-sung or any member of the ruling Kim family, you must demonstrate joy while looking at them. You must jump, shout, wave your arms with joy. And when he leaves you, you should, so to speak, look at him with tears. And if he dies, then you need to go out into the street and cry, especially if there's a camera or some sort of boss nearby, then you must do it. So uh, the one who directs this, does he realize that it looks kind of weird? But he's not doing it for you. He's not doing it for me. He's doing it for the locals. So don't forget. North Korean propaganda works on people with completely different perceptions. Well, not quite. In some ways, they are the same as us, right? In some ways, completely different. This is done for the local audience. One time, they seriously fought for the foreign audience, but that was a long time ago. Now there are small groups of chuchu lovers around the planet with zero political influence. Sometimes when there is a situational alliance with Russia or with China, uh, then positive reports about them may be presented. But this will be done by the Chinese, respectively, or the Russian or Iranian or Syrian television applicable to its audience. And so all this, what we discussed, they shoot this for themselves. This is shown to a local audience. 
time. Okay, fine. Uh, could you please explain? Uh, the average North Korean will watch this and what what happens next? Well, he will watch and think about how much they love the leader. Or but maybe he won't think about think this. What do you think that this is all fake? Well, I think that he understands that almost everything that he has shown on television is a fake. Moreover, he believes in many cases that this is the case all over the world. That is one of the problems, well, not, not problems, but features. When he sees, for example, South Korean films, he often thinks, although in South Korean films there is often, not always, a tendency to exaggerate because people like to watch A Beautiful Life, but in principle, modern South Korea is, is shown quite realistically in South Korean films. But the North Koreans, they often perceive this as this was done for the film. It cannot be that every family had a car. Well, this is an old story, but just let me tell this. So now, of course, it would sound a little bit different, but until about 2010 in North Korea, a symbol of wealth uh, was a refrigerator. It was a refrigerator. A fridge. I knew two people who were simply, they just simply bought refrigerators, and they have issues with electricity. You can't power the refrigerator with a battery or with an accumulator. You can't power with a portable generator either, which, which makes a terrible noise disturbing the neighbors. But still, they bought it. They bought it for themselves so that everyone else could see that they could afford it. It's like a Porsche or a BMW. Which cannot be refueled. Yes, but this doesn't matter. It's there, which means I can afford it. But going back to the story, it was one North Korean woman, a young teacher. She had a business, a smart girl. She was 25 then, under 30, at least. Uh, she escaped here through China, and she, it was back then it was possible, now it's almost impossible, uh, she talked to her parents on the, on the phone. So how did she do that? The parents received a Chinese phone connected to the Chinese network, though a rather complex scheme in the border areas, then there were no ping radars, and they simply did not exist then, and they appeared later. So they just didn't happen. So people could call abroad. And then if they had a Chinese phone, they were able to do this. But somebody had to pay for it in China. Or having such a phone, you could rent it to reliable people. Although this was a strongly criminal case at the time. If you have a Chinese phone, it's considered espionage. Oh. Yes, but people still do it. And so she talks to her father and like says that like everything is fine. And I have a refrigerator in the kitchen. And the father was a little bit frightened. Why so? He was afraid that his daughter had been recruited by the South Korean CIA and was generally undergoing some stressful training there. After all, a normal person can have a refrigerator at home. By the way, now it's possible. I'm saying that this was the thing about 15 years ago. But this was a demonstration of prosperity. Therefore, when they see South Korean films, where they have a car in every apartment, in every family, rather, and on average, in South Korea, there are 20 million cars for 51 million people, which means that there is one and a half to two cars per family on average. But when North Koreans see this, they don't really believe it. That is, yes, they understand that this is propaganda. But here you understand, the point is, here everything is much more complicated. The thing is that we, when we are especially drawn into some sort of political confrontations, and we are all connected to one degree or another, we do not understand that it's hard for someone in this context right here. So, on the one hand, he understands that this is propaganda, but if this propaganda resonates with something in his soul, then... He is ready to close his eyes to some ob obvious inconsistencies with the truth. Moreover, this is not connected with any political movement, be that left or right. Statists or liberals, they are all the same. They are all homo sapiens. Accordingly, a person seems to understand that this is propaganda, but somewhere deep inside it can resonate with him. And even the falsest propaganda still affects a person. It still leaves some kind of trace in the head. And on this, of course, well, with all of this... It's all absurdity, and this is applicable to all of us. For North Koreans, I repeat, it looks less absurd than it does for us. Not everyone knows, but Kim Jong-un had a half-brother. Yes, he had one. And he was poisoned in 2017. Yes. In Malaysia. Yes, in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, he had an antidote, but he didn't have time to use it. He got confused and he didn't have time. He was ready for such a turn of events and he'd been hunted for a long time. Two women ran up to him from behind and used a yes, cloth yes, to, to uh, apply poison to substance, yes. And he died. He died, yes, as it should be. Uh, who killed him? Well, isn't it obvious? The North Korean special services had been hunting him for a long time. And the thing is that he had been living in China for quite a while and had, shall we say, very good relationships with the Chinese, which made the North Koreans nervous. 
The North Koreans, you have to understand one thing. When I'm told that the North Koreans have friends, they don't. The traditional line of North Korea is very simple. The whole world is against us. And so that's what it is. But we have situational alliances. Today we are friends with Russia and can say a lot of nice things. But at the same time, I will not be surprised if I find out that at the time of when one official is saying that they are united with Russia in the fight against American imperialism, there's another unofficial person somewhere in a quiet country in Southeast Asia who talking to some, uh, some other official American, meaning a quiet North Korean, is talking to a quiet American about something uh, completely different from the party line. From the point of view of the North Koreans, the whole world is a pile uh, is a pile of spiders where everyone is against everyone. And where, uh, for example, China, which is supposedly their main sponsor, is, is also their main source of problems. And accordingly, they strive to keep China at arm's length. This specific case, right he here, when a person being the eldest uh, son of a former leader practically flees to China, settles there, and lives there, having the Chinese demonstrate their favor to him in every way, this makes North Koreans nervous. Well, if in a small kingdom, some prince runs away to a neighboring large empire with which they are even friends and do not fight, and all of a sudden the prince is given a castle, well, certain unpleasant consequences arise in this case, and it may be necessary to privately talk to the prince's cook, and the issue will be solved. They just saw him as an agent of influence, moreover, an agent of the Chinese influence primarily. Moreover, he was very active. He, he was quite... He was public. Uh, he was, well, a moderately public person. He constantly communicated to journalists on his own um, uh, initiative. He gave interviews, not some dissident interviews, but quite honest and frank ones. That is, if you look at what he said during this time, um, I mean, I repeat, he did not say anything sharp, obviously anti-governmental, but he kept exposing what was behind the curtain. Well, for example, he clearly once said that they would, of course, like to carry out reforms, but they were afraid that reforms in opening the country will lead to instability and to the fall of the regime. You know what I mean? And so on. And he said such things. This is obvious, really, it is. But when a representative of the ruling dynasty says that, like, um, if we allow the people too much, the people will send us to the guillotine, this is somehow not quite right. Is it true that he wanted to enter Japan with his family using fake Dominican passports to visit Tokyo Disneyland? And that this became the reason yes. for the quarrel with his father? Well, yes, I think that... that when he was still alive. Well, I think that A, this is true. B, this did not become the reason for the quarrel with his father. Yes, he really went to Disneyland, but do you know that what he doesn't make sense in the story? The fact that he had been going to Japan using a fake passport constantly, even before that, and this was never a problem. For some reason, the Japanese, who in principle knew who this person was when he came to them before with different passports, decided to stop him down at the border control where they stand. So why did they decide to do this? Well, I'm 60 years old, I hardly will live to find out. There are young, talented historians and specialists in general who will find out. But in due time, it will become known, but not soon. Uh, but in any case, to say that, as it is often presented, quite very primitively, Walt went to Japan without his father's permission, and his father found out and got angry. He went to Japan constantly. And the fact that he became persona non grata was not really influenced um, by this story much in any way. So most likely it did not have an influence. There must have been other reasons there. Mm. Uh, do you think that North Korean elite ask themselves the question, um, why can't we have a Disneyland uh, of our own? Why should we? They have? do. But they also ask themselves, what would happen to our to the submarine if we open the hatch? That's it. Ah. That's it. I see. So they mean they're afraid to lose power along with Absolutely the regime. Absolutely right for this. Moreover, A, they're afraid, B, they are right to do so. They will go down as well. So North Korea is this type of country that can poison their political opponents in other countries. Well, yes, but I think that there are many such regimes, uh, in, including those that, you know, have quite positive connotations. Not many, but they exist. Yes, they can. Uh, which one do you imply? Well, for example, the Israeli one. Israel poisoned their opponents? Well, they shot, I guess, and maybe they poisoned them too. Mobile phones exploded as well. And this is, this is highly relevant to Iranian nuclear physicists in recent years. A, a professor of, of nuclear physics at Tehran University simply cannot leave his house. 
Because they would die, right? For some reason, they explode. You see, their cars have started to explode oh. a lot in mass. No, there was no irony in my question. I'm just not aware. No, I'm just letting you know. I'm just letting you know. I won't say that it's a common practice, but so to speak, it's not a very rare one. What does an average 30-year-old Pingyang citizen look like? Well, it depends, really. What can a person work as? Pyongyang remains an elite city. There was a large number of officials of various kinds. Uh, there was quite a large number of various management um, employees close to the officials. And there were many scientific and technical employees. Um, there were those missile engineers that we spoke about earlier and others. Uh, I mean, the city, the difference, be- the difference between Pyongyang and the outskirts is very, very major. So let's say, let's say he's an engineer. So that's what he is. Okay. Uh, an engineer of the MIC, let's say. Uh, what would be his salary? He won't be earning much, uh, especially if he is an engineer of the MIC. This is the state sector. All the military industry is state-owned. At the current exchange rate, he's be earning a couple of dollars a month. But don't be scared by that number. Don't be scared. A couple of dollars? Yes, about that time. Not 50? No, not a 50. A couple? A couple. But besides this, he will be receiving bonuses. Okay. And besides this, he will be receiving a large number of various benefits in some sort of way. Uh... For example, he will have almost free food. What do you mean, like rations? If this person is an engineer of the MIC, they will fully supply him with these food cards. And this means that he will be receiving about uh, 600 grams of rice, or rather a mixture of rice and corn per day. Uh, He will be receiving some amount of meat. Moreover, the amount of meat will become bigger gradually. Uh, in addition, we'll be receiving various bonuses. That is, the formal salary is very low, but the bonuses are quite large. So I think that in reality, a 30-year-old man will be earning a total of 50 to $70 a month. But mostly, uh, this is all due to various kinds of additions to his formal s- uh, salary, let's say. So plus, uh, there will be other pleasant things for him, uh, pleasant bonuses, so to speak. Uh, that he um, receives for doing this job. And if he works in the private sector, then the salary will be much bigger. A qualified worker in the private sector can receive $100. An in, in engineer working there, a mining engineer, earning very good money. Or, for example, a teacher or a tutor. There can be, or be more than 100 there. What if he decides to rent an apartment? How much will he spend on it? Uh, renting an apartment in Pyongyang now? By the way, renting an apartment is possible. It used to be forbidden. Now it's quite common. I'm not ready to answer this. I don't know, to be honest. Mm-hmm. But uh, would that be enough for a living? Well, Or is it where food card system starts to shine? Well, if you're lucky and you work in those sectors where the food card system works, then the system is there are a minority of such people in the country. The card system used to be a country-wise. Now it isn't so only on paper, but for most people, the cards are not supplied regularly. Usually, the cards are supplied during uh, public holidays, but if you work in some sort of important enterprises or industry... Uh, then they supply you with food cards more or less constantly. And if you're fully supplied, then a significant part of the food is practically free for you. It is sold for some sort of insignificant sum. You pay some money, but it's nothing really. It's insignificant. How about an average 30-year-old person in the province? Much worse. Much worse. But most likely he will depend much more on the private sector, per se, as for the income, I would say. Really, about half of what it's earned in Pyongyang. I would say in Pyongyang, in its majority, it would be 50 to 70 a month in dollars. Moreover, this this is not really a salary, but rather all of the earnings combined. And in the province, I think it's about half of that. What does he work as? Um, In the province, well, someone may work, of course, in the state sector. It is still quite present there. And we're not talking about the city and not a village here. So someone may work in the service sector or trade, for example. Uh, If the sea is nearby, then, of course, the person will will do something related to fishing, per se. And naturally, if these are mines, mines or miners will be working there. It's all different. And for women... It's not really clear for now how all of this will turn out, but in the border areas, there were quite a lot of these Chinese textile factories, the factories that are owned by Chinese investors that have investments from that country uh, where they make clothes. Uh, For China? For China. 
Mm. Meaning North Korean labor force costs less than Chinese. Well, just incomparably less. Come on, please. If you, if you pay a North Korean worker $1 a day, she will be insanely happy. A Chinese worker, I don't know, maybe in the province, you will have to pay 1,500 yuan. Uh, this part of me is about 330 to $300, somewhere around that amount, I would say, probably in that sort of area. Uh, let me read something and you tell me if this is true or not. All right. North Koreans are required to register their televisions with the management yes. authorities. Three channels are available. In order not to be tempted to watch something else, the management authorities seal the TVs and block the frequency settings. Yes. yes. Well, not quite. The frequency settings are not always blocked. It's a bit of a technical issue. But sealing, they just seal it, yes. Only three channels? Th three channels, yes. Government radio cannot be turned off, even in your own home. The only thing you can do is turn down the volume a bit. Not quite. This is about the so-called cable broadcasting, uh, not government radio, but this is a second radio. In addition to the usual one, so to speak, which broadcasts and which can be listened to abroad, there is also something called cable radio. Yes, in Russia, it's called cable radio. So cable radios should be on in the sense that they are always connected to the hard lines, like the landline of the house. But you can turn down the sound completely, and this is not an issue at all. Oh, it must be functional. It must be functioning, yes. Uh, this is explained in general quite reasonably, and in my opinion, honestly. Uh, this is due to air defense broadcasts. Any warning about natural disasters, all of this is transmitted precisely through this broadcast network. It allows you to transmit information with minimal risk of interception, because foreigners won't be able to hear it at all, and it targets the specific regions that are a part of the country. North Korean men can only wear short haircuts. Moreover, only 28 hairstyles approved by the state. Uh, so 28 hairstyles, these are just recommended ones that hang in the hairdresser's office, but you can have others. So short haircuts, yes, they f are fine for long hair or for dyed hair. Here is a story from very recent history from 2018. Um, uh, in fact, there were two things here. I just saw these patrols. I was there at the time. And especially outside of Pyongyang, fashion patrols, women's union patrols were actively operating operating, which stopped people who violated, so to speak, the prescribed socialist norms with their dressings, meaning they fined people with dyed hair if they walked around. Were well, there, there such were cases? In general, yeah. I have an acquaintance who is Chinese and has a residence permit uh, in North Korea, where he lives. So there are Chinese citizens, citizens of the PRC, and who have the right to live in North Korea. And this is the only group of foreigners who live there. And he has a son. His son periodically, well, usually this is normal, his son dyed his hair there. A young Chinese guy walks around with dyed hair, nothing major at all. And then he was stopped. And like every three to four days, I'm sorry, the three to four times a day they stopped people. But he just showed the passport and said, look here, citizen of the PRC. And uh, they said, sorry. Uh, uh, Chinese people are, are allowed to, to have dyed hair, but they're, they periodically caught w women for various outstanding um, um, outstanding looks. For a while, women were not allowed to wear pants outside of work. Then this was canceled. People who observed this, uh, these are foreigners who worked there, wrote like their female staff in the offices, was very pleased with the limitations that were lifted there. But um, in, in general, yes, long hair is prohibited. They will stop you, cut your hair, and you'll have administrative problems. Is it the same fashion patrol that can measure skirt length with well, a ruler? Well, this is the case in South Korea. So they use rulers to measure such things in South Korea. So this was the case in South Korea in the 1970s when patrols in South Korea stopped ladies and girls with skirts that seemed too short and then they checked the length. I think it was less than, no less than 10 centimeters if measured from the ground. This was considered a, um, um, a, a minor violation if the length was uh, less than, than 10 centimeters. And anyway, all of this exists. There were patrols and I've seen them work, so they had whistles. Uh, there were ladies in dark uniforms with whistles that they had, that they whistled at. Another one. Uh, at night, to save electricity, uh, the supply of electricity to the homes of North Koreans is turned off. Only the illumination of monuments uh, to The illumination is also usually turned off. They just turn it off later. Well, when there were acute problems, they are still there, but there were very acute problems with electricity. Um, yes, so this was done. They turned it off, and not only at night, they would do it during the day as well. Fain shut down to come to practice. People with power and money simply connected their homes to uh, state institutions where they didn't exactly turn off electricity. Did that help? Well, why not? Well, you've made a deal with some local military facility with some sort of local missile base and, and got linked into their power supply. There's no electricity for nobody except you and the refrigerator keeps working fine. Maybe even uh, air conditioner. 
Or you can give a bribe to the local, um, so to speak, manager and simply just lay a line separately to the transformer station that they have, and he will not off the electricity for you. They won't turn it off. But for most people, yes, there are issues with electricity. Yeah. Uh, can you buy contraceptives in North Korea? Oh, it has always been possible. Uh, since the 1970s there, uh, now there was a program to increase the birth rates, which does not always work. And moreover, there are reasons to believe that they greatly overstate their birth rate. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, but it seems that they manipulated it there in order to, so to speak, to show, after all, they published demographic data. Unlike many others, uh, po population statistics are always open there. It is being published. So, But it seems to, that they manipulate it a little bit, adjust it. And so as for the um, your question, the contraceptives, it's fine. In the 1970s, a very active struggle was waged there to reduce the birth rates. Mandatory lectures were held. There were... Um, so that there is less people to feed. Uh, well, this, this is interesting. So we're talking about the 1970s. A dynamic campaign was being executed in South Korea to reduce the birth rates. Uh -huh. Extremely dynamic. And in many ways, the North cosplayed South Korea without admitting it. Moreover, this was coming in the 1970s in the world in general, in China too. Soon after that, the one-child policy had been introduced. And there was a confidence there this was such an axiom that if you wanted some sort of like economic growth, you cannot afford high birth rates. Yeah. They read all of this and then made a decision. So, in the 70s, in North Korea, you could buy condoms? Yes, of course you could. Are female hygiene products sold in North Korea? So, this is an interesting question. They have had problems with that. Now, they are Chinese products. But in the 1970s, I'm not really ready to answer. I'm sorry. No, no, not in the 70s. I mean, now. Well, you can, you can buy, buy anything pads, that you for want. Example? Everything is brought in from China. They have imports. Now, Korea has everything. If you go to a department store, a good Korean department store, then you will see that they have everything there. It's very curious. We constantly have photographs of empty store shelves appearing in the press from North Korea, right? And they say, look, they have literally nothing in North Korea. They have nothing. That's quite funny to hear all of this. For some reason in stores, they're, they are oriented purely towards foreigners. There is indeed a very small selection. Uh -huh. uh, these are their former uh, interest stores. But if you go to a normal, ordinary department stores, I'm not talking about the market. On the market, as they say, you can buy everything except cat horns. Cats don't have horns, so you can't buy them there. Uh, you see, they have literally everything. It's just, it's it's uh, the same in state trade. Well, it's not quite state trade because a significant part of their stores is registered as a state-owned, but belongs to private individuals. They have everything there. Everything is bought from China with some goods are produced locally. And, and during the recent times of Kim Jong-un's rule, there were reforms and the economy began to revive. There was a period of growth there. But now it's all over. A combination of sanctions, coronavirus, and many other factors have their impact on all of this. So um, as long as you have money, you can really buy anything. Money remains an issue in North Korea, though. Are LGBT people uh, prosecuted? No, no. Uh, how to say, well, it is believed that there are no LGBT people in the country. And according to... And, well, accordingly, there was no corresponding article in the criminal uh -huh. code. Yet there well, are LGBT people there. Well, genetically, there must be some. But they they state that we we do not have them, and we consider this a terrible capitalist perversion. This does not um, uh, doesn't exist and can't exist. Accordingly, we do not have LGBT movement, and there is no mm. article. Sounds quite liberal for a totalitarian yeah, yes, system. Yes, yes. In 2009, there was a strike in the DPRK. Uh, there was civil unrest, and you wrote about this in the book. Yes, they had it coming. It was complete nonsense, really. There was a monetary yes, reform. Yes, completely an idiotic to monetary reform. And those who were working on, or one way or another involved in the North Korean market, began to burn their banknotes. Yes, a lot of things happened back then. Uh, there, people just, um, even security forces, people bound by duty, were driven nuts, really. You see, it was you know, so nonsensical that a person could say, um, imagine a North Korean spy could go to a foreign spy who were both compromised and knew that they were spies. So he could say, listen, I don't know what's going on. It seems that our government has gone crazy. Really? Uh, <laughs> so imagine one to? colonel saying this to another colonel. Uh, what were they trying to do? What were they trying to do? In the sense of what the North Koreans wanted? Yeah. Uh, no, no, no. What were they trying to achieve with this monetary so reform? So the monetary reform was, of course, the most comic monetary reform in world history. Um, it's no wonder that its organizer was shot, although it's clear that it was not the only organizer, but someone from higher echelons. So they made a scapegoat out of the poor uh, Pak Nam Ji. Um, so they, they declared him a spy, naturally. And he came up with a monetary reform as a spy. And the reform was about the following. 
They conceived a classic confiscatory monetary reform, an old proven trick. This was done in the Soviet Union hell knows how many times. And accordingly, uh, they conceived this very monetary reform. Uh, well, the traditional version. Old money must be exchanged within a week, within a very, sm very small limit. Everything else is disposed of. What you fail to exchange gets disposed of too. And then there became a completely wonderful trick. They stated that when we first received this information, and the information stream was fine, the information was coming practically in real time, although nothing was written about this in the open press at all, you understand a monetary reform took place in the country. Nothing was written about this at all in the Korean newspapers. This is for you to understand the peculiarities of the North Korean press. So in the newspapers, the, but the North Koreans published abroad, this was published. But in the newspapers that they published at home, it was not. But anyways, the information went public. And when this happened, in general, people did not believe it because it seemed that it was said that a denomination was taking place. Two zeros were being crossed out. But wages at state-owned enterprises would be paid in new banknotes in the old volume. This means an instant increase in wages by a hundred times. Increase? By a hundred times. Increase? Yes. Uh -huh. yes. Okay. This I was see. probably Kim Jong-il's idea. He said, let's reward those who didn't go into private businesses but stayed in the state sector. All right. This means that they immediately created a huge overhang of money supply. You got to understand, wages in the country increased by 100 okay. times. Uh, yes, unexpectedly. Accordingly, after a month and a half, there was a huge hyperinflationary surge that they had. Markets, trying to suppress it, simply tried to force the traders to sell goods at old, denominated prices, which were 100 times lower than it was now. And so, although formerly the buyer salary for work was 100 times higher than they ended up having it at all, that was what it was. Uh huh. Accordingly, the market stopped functioning normally. They were closed. Then they closed the currency stores, which fed a significant part of the elite and the privileged part of the population. There was a moment there somewhere in December, in early January, when it was um, it was impossible to get food at all. You would have a suitcase of dollars at home, and so what? There was no help. It was a suitcase of cut paper back then. Uh, uh, and then, of course, they started to push back. They first opened up the markets, then let this inflation burn out, and prices stabilized at about the same level that it had been at. Well, not quite, but about the same level as before the reform. It was what it was. Well, the head of the financial department, who was responsible for the organization, was arrested. And then, only rumors circulated, but a couple of years later, it was officially reported that we exposed him. While he was studying in Czechoslovakia in the 1950s, in a visionist Czechoslovakia, he was infected there with the wrong ideology, and he was recruited there by American intelligence. And on behalf of American intelligence, he was embedded higher and higher to carry out a sabotage reform in their country. Uh -huh. But we, of course, caught him and um, executed him. Uh, there you go. It was a completely unprecedented case when the prime minister apologized, officially apologized, not during an open event, but at a meeting of these uh, these ladies from uh, Imenbank, heads of um, the heads of people's groups. He officially apologized for the reform. That is, it was a complete pushback. Uh, how did people participate? I mean, the citizens. Well, the indignation was universal. And how was it, it expressed? Was, what did the they people do? People burned money, spoke publicly. They were grumbling. Well, the authorities f felt that the people, so to speak. Were there any rallies at uh, that no, time? No, there were no rallies. Rallies used to happen occasionally before this when the markets were closed. But any, any attempts? I mean, well, here's the thing. The North Korea protests are possible, but, but they are absolutely non-political. That is, the government calmly watches the situation in which North Koreans are ready to defend their right to make some money, including in the private sector, meaning when they try to do something with the markets, uh, to, to do something with the markets. Markets, you mean food or, or general goods? Oh, well, it's the same. They're, okay. they're together. Uh -huh. Yes, private markets. Sometimes they're separated, but usually together. Uh, so when they try to do something with this, uh, then... Uh, Sometimes there were some disturbances. For example, in Pyongyang, I think in 2007 or 2008, this did not get into newspapers, yet there was a case like this. So then there was a campaign to fight the private sector, which ultimately failed just after the reform. Um, basically, they not only rolled back, they said, that's it. We won't touch the private sector, trade, enrich ourselves, everything's fine. We won't do it anymore. Uh, so then when this campaign was going on, they introduced some rule. So 
A person who buys, well, you get a space on the market for a long-term rent. There are some minor details there, but, but, but conditionally speaking, he would want 80 centimeters to put a trading point. And suddenly, a new decision came out that a person can have such a point that this is. Usually, it was the lady. Uh, so she could have a trading point only in the market located in the area where she is registered. And many, of course, paid more money for more advantageous yeah. places there. And this was confiscated. And so the ladies went out for a strike with minor collateral damage, and the government pushed back. Uh-huh. That's it. That is when the ladies started to make noise, uh, 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 um, uh, shout and stir up in front of the local administration, it became clear and the issue was resolved. So uh, rallies are possible, but they are not related to politics. Um, not really at all. Can we talk briefly about politics? What do you think about the last meeting between Putin and Kim Jong-un? Well, when I look at it from two points of view here. So first of all, it is now more and more obvious that there are shippings of artillery shells and ammunition. Um, ammunition is always obviously needed during the war. And so that makes perfect sense. This is apparently there is a shell hunger. And since North Korea made a huge, um, produced a huge amount of ammunition for standard Soviet calibers, well, their, their weapons are either Soviet or copies, clones of Soviet samples that they've been given. Uh, then they can sell certain quantities of this ammunition. I don't think that they will sell a lot. They don't really want to expose themselves completely. So business standpoint comes first. Uh, second, all these uh, exceptionally militarized nature of contacts, like meeting at the Cosmodrome, trips to military facilities. Well, I think that this is an attempt to send a signal to Seoul so the Seoul can continues to adhere to its old line on refusing to provide Ukraine with any lethal military aid for the war. So that uh -huh. is, South Korea, being one of the largest manufacturers, a very fast-growing player in the global arms market, uh, does not supply Ukraine with any lethal military aid. They supply medical aid Any only. kind. No, they do uh, not supply military aid, not non-lethal. Mm -hmm. Like body armor, helmets, all of this is being supplied. I'm not really sure about body armor, but I'm sure about helmets. But uh, so anything non-lethal. So this is the condition. Apparently, they're hinting that if South Korea agrees to this, if South Korea s uh, starts supplying weapons directly to Ukraine, then, then Russia may transfer some military technologies to North Korea. But in my opinion, this is a rather risky game here. This is a um, sort of a counter blow, like a blackmail fight, because on the other hand, South Korea might think that Russia is transferring these technologies to North Korea and start supplying weapons to Ukraine um, in response to this. So this is an attempt at mutual diplomatic blackmail. And in addition to this, the second direction is a standard purchase of weapons, uh, mostly shells as it seems. And uh, that's it. And the last points, um, well, this is this is a generally uh, uh, this is generally an attempt to establish some trade relations, although I do not believe in the success of this attempt whatsoever. Uh -huh. I recently spoke with an experienced diplomat and specialist in the country, an elderly man um, who said that during his life, working service life, uh, he had witnessed three attempts to activate the Russian uh, North Korean or Soviet North Korean trade between the two countries. And they were... Um, they were shut down very quickly, and it didn't work. So if you talk about the economy, what can be used in the context is the working force. North Korean workers are a good, a very good option. And I hope that this will be done, which, by the way, which will be a violation of UN sanctions. But in general, I think that it was a big mistake. Sanctions are generally not a very successful idea. And the fact that Russia agreed to participate in them, starting from... Well, I know where they started. There were many factors, but it's not relevant now that Russia agreed to accept North Korean workers. This was, of course, mm, a mistake for the situation. It was definitely a mistake. It is considered that having North Korea as an ally is very indicative for a country. Uh, what do you think about this? Well, someone has North Korea as an ally, someone has Saudi Arabia as an ally, who were very much grinding the opposition in consulates. Someone has other allies. International politics is such a complex matter. You can take any country. Remember the fancy allies that France has. 
And France is considered a very nice place in the sense that there is democracy and, and, and human rights. And sometimes they give birth to natural monsters. Yes, correct. In Africa, I understand in Africa, in Africa, what yes. you mean by Saudi Arabia. The USA, obviously. Well, yes, of course, yeah. the USA. And France toyed with very strange regimes in France in the 1980s. In, in excuse Africa. Excuse me, in Africa. Uh, so uh, there were all sorts of stories. If you take Kim Il Sen, of course, excuse me, Kim Jong-un. He's a controversial person, but much more controversial was Pol Pot. And look who supplied Pol Pot with weapons. It will be a very interesting list. So you understand, in politics, they make friends with those with whom it is beneficial to make friends at the moment. In principle, well, let's say that there are countries that sometimes remember about principles, uh, rarely. And most countries do not remember about this at all, only when they give a beautiful speech at the UN. So here it is. Uh, yes, it's bad. But you know, any regime uh, that is much more odious than the current North Koreans, uh, one always had patrons, among whom were regimes that were not at all odious, but very respected. Is it correct to think that, in fact, the DPRK is now fully subsidized and supported by China? Definitely. Moreover, this is not just correct. This is as obvious as it is hot in hot summer and cold in winter. Of course, absolutely. Uh, is it because China wants to have a bridgehead in front of them in case the U.S. attacks China? China. I would say that it's more precisely a bridgehead is needed when you want to invade. So China is definitely not going to invade towards South Korea no, no, at all. No, no, if the U.S. Uh, invades right. well, China. I see what you mean. So this is called a buffer zone. Uh -huh. Yes. Okay. They need a buffer zone, uh, which uh, firstly creates a strategic advantage in case of war with the United States. And most importantly, simply allows to keep, say, American radio technical reconnaissance facilities uh, at a certain distance. Uh, let's imagine that for some reason China refuses to pay these several billions or, or maybe there was another well, amount. a couple of billion. Yeah. A catastrophe. But the thing is that North Korea has an excellent diplomatic school. They have gotten out of even worse situations before, for sure. Moreover, if several hundred thousand people die of hunger there, then the leadership of North Korea will be upset about this, but will not resign. So their diplomats have demonstrated their skills more than once, playing on the contradictions of the great powers that they have. They always manage to find sponsors. That is, it will be a catastrophe. It will be bad. Part of the common people will go hungry. Someone will die from this, perhaps. But the diplomats will focus, the intelligence will focus, the brains will start working, and they will find some sort of combination. They would find another country to sell their influence yes, to, right? Yes. This can be a combination that includes Russia, Japan, the United States, South Korea, anyone. They have done this, and they have made it out before. So just look at how it was, how they were struck between the Soviet and the Chinese. Well, not stuck between the Soviet Union and China. They used the Soviet Union and China, in fact. I will give you the brief overview, simplifying it a little bit. Of course, it's way more complicated, and you can write big books about this whole situation. But maybe I will do it when I'm old enough. I mean, the materials are out there, and they're declassified. You just need to sit down and spend several years on this. Um, but it's very interesting. Shen Zhihua, a very good Chinese historian, an outstanding one, writes books about this whole thing. Um, even though um, even though he lives in China, he's not facing issues with censorship. And so, what, uh, so what did North Korea do? Basically, they came to they came to Moscow and said, "Give us this, this, and this. And if you don't give us this, we will go to China." And they got something. Not everything that they asked for, but when they asked for Nagan, that is ballistic missiles, they never got them. The Soviet Union did not transfer any serious military technologies to North Korea at all. And then they went to Beijing and said, we need this and this and this. And if you do not give this to us, we will go to Moscow. And at the same time, it was necessary to scold Chinese hegemonism in Moscow and to scold Soviet revisionism in Beijing. And they hinted, if you do not feed us, we will go over to the other side. And that's it. What yeah. And it worked. It actually worked. It worked out really well. Leonid Ilyich Brezhnev personally could not stand Kim Jong-sung. There was more to it, including some personal uh, aversion. I mean, he was not so much a friend, but Brezhnev sympathized with one of our Koreans. And a wonderful, intelligent, talented man who worked there, who um, in general was represented and killed by Kim Il-sung. And Brezhnev did not like it all very much at all. Well, not a friend, but a close comrade, practically a friend of Brezhnev. Um, there was a lot more, but, but politics is about strategy. Deep down, Brezhnev did not love and despised Kim Il-sung. It is possible that it was mutual in the case of Kim Il-sung, but uh, alas, pure politics. Have you watched Vitaly Mansky's film about North Korea? 
Uh, I, I even wrote a fairly harsh review because in his desire to tell the truth, in my opinion, he, um, uh, of course, uh, contributed to uh, the anti-North Korean myth that exists. It is a lot of what he says, all these stories about stories with empty shelves. Well, yes, you can find an empty store, but in most cases, there will be goods for sale. Uh, he stated that the shootings that took place in a house were all staged. And so, yes, of course, it's obvious, but well, obviously that's what it was. But it, any contact with a foreign journalist in North Korea will be staged and rehearsed countless times. So that is when a North Korean appears in front of the camera. Any of his movements is calculated, discussed, agreed upon, approved by 20 people. And accordingly, when he was interviewing, the way people behaved was discussed and approved uh, several times. And that's just how the whole thing works. Uh, there was a discussion that by keeping the footage of informal conversations with these people, yes. he put them at great risk. Well, most likely he did not put them at great risk because generally they they did not really say anything particularly terrible there as far as I could remember. But the North Korean special services and authority representatives were close by who were in principle control of the situation, if I remember correctly. So I don't think that anything happened to them. Although, of course, if you learn something uh, extra about North Korea... Um, it's better not to talk about it. Hence, by the way, one of the features, while well, other person, if you can say so, uh, one of the features that is if they often ask um, North Korean guys who work with foreigners, do, do, do they believe in what they say? Um, in most cases, I am inclined to think that they do not believe or believe only partially very. Because I repeat, a human being is a is a complex creation. He is able to partially believe in something. But here's the thing. If, for example, the guide starts to get too close to the tourists, who can guarantee that the tourist will not tell about it out of his stupidity or will not publish it in some big blog later, and then the guide will have problems. Why would he want to be involved? In the worst case scenario, they can put him in jail. In the best case, he will not get promotion of work, and the service is quite good. So why would he disclose something sensitive to a stranger whom he sees for the first time and will never see again after spending a few days with him? And so I think when, when communicating with foreigners, uh, uh, really, North Koreans are very careful in this situation. But at the same time, Mansky secretly took out the... Yes, of course. But this is common practice. A lot of things are taken out there. My God, there's so much of it being taken out. There was a large amount of video materials uh, shot. For example, video shootings um, on the market. Uh, there are thousands of hours of documentaries about North Korea. So not only footage, but photographs as well. And uh -huh. Well, in all of this, um, it was shot illegally and taken out also illegally. Is there a punishment for this? For example, what if they caught Lyadov yes. well, yes. making his film? Well, if they were to catch Lyadov, nothing bad would have happened to him. He's a foreigner. If he were an American, they could stage a political play about his detention. A citizen of any other country, well, I mean, if they caught him, they would make him delete the footage. It would be some minor problems. They would not let him come into North Korea again. But maybe for a shakeup, they would keep him in a comfortable room for several days under an alleged arrest in a hotel. That's it. Mm -hmm. But if we are talking about North um, about North Koreans who supposedly try to sell such materials, then yes, this is a guaranteed criminal case. Uh, there was the story about an American guy who was sent to a labor camp. Yes, supposedly he was sent there. Can you tell us what actually happened? Well, yes. So, no, this is a pretty common thing for them. They probably don't do this really so much anymore. They've learned their lessons. This is a, a small propaganda show, North Korean style. Uh, moreover, this was only done with Americans. Uh, from time to time, an American, while on North Korean territory, does something stupid. In this particular case, he entered a building where it was clearly written, he, he may not have understood, of course, but he could not have failed to understand, entrance forbidden to outsiders, and tore down a propaganda poster to demonstrate his temper, temper so to speak. Um, also, this was the case when two daring journalists crossed the border. So, uh, at that time, the border was practically unguarded. This was 15 years ago, so a long time ago, um, really. So, they, they, crossed, they crossed the river and entered North, North Korea. And they were immediately arrested by the border guards that were standing at the border. Uh, there was an incident in 1996. I think some drunk guy, also an American, simply he simply swam across the river into North Korea. And this is what happened. Uh, he was obviously arrested. And when this happened, a completely straightforward scenario occurred next. If anyone but an American had done this, they would scold the person in various ways and then probably just let him go. But then, just like the silly things that Russian or Chinese tourists did there, there were many such cases. But if an American did this, they would detain him, a, a trial would be held for him, 
at which he would give uh, some sort of penitent speech. He would get a harsh sentence for, um, for all sorts of uh, sabotage that he had done, indestructive actions, um, he or she. Women also fell into these situations. It also has happened to have women there. Uh, And after that, the North Koreans waited. It was their demand. They agreed upon having a high-level American delegation to come to them, preferably headed by a former uh, former American president. Well, maybe the governor of some backwater state. Uh, So they would come, express apologies, and take away the guilty one with them. And then, the next day, it would be all presented into the newspapers. This was front-page news. That, like, American imperialists once again came to us on their knees to ask, so to speak, uh, for um, for mercy after their another unsuccessful Ohio provocation. That sounds beautiful, right? And they decided to do the same in this case, too. But then something happened. There were claims that the man was tortured. An American passport holder, a foreign passport holder in general, would be imprisoned and sent to a labor camp in North Korea, but not now. It was like that before. I'd say in the 50s and 60s. And the most recent case, this was the case of Ali Lamed. It happened in the end of the 1960s. And this was about half a century ago, possibly even more. Since then, even if a person formally receives a sentence there, he's allegedly sent to prison, which is a special institution built specifically for foreigners, where the level of comfort is that of an average North Korean hotel for their own people, but not for foreigners. Of course, for a person from a Western country, this place is not necessarily very comfortable, but mildly speaking, it's not a prison. Not the gulag, let's say that. But in general, they wanted to stage this spectacle, and something happened to him, and it is unclear what happened. It's really not. A suicide attempt or an accident, it could be anything really. Moreover, judging by some reactions, those who were responsible did not dare to report the authorities on the situation here, and then they did not know what to do with it at all, with the person involved. Oh. So, there you go. And I assume that after all this went wrong for them, they no longer play such games like this. Although, really, who knows? Are you sure he would have been released after American delegation they arrived? Did. They always They always did. He was not the first, not the second. And they wouldn't even have to release some arms dealer in response. There was no need for that. They would just come and ask to release the prisoner, and that was it. And after that, on the next day, it was always on the front pages of the newspaper. And this is big news. This would have been another North Korean political triumph targeted at their own audience. It is targeted at a local audience. You told Ilya Varlamov in detail about the unification of Korea, yes. the unification of South and North. You don't believe in this idea. Mm, well, it may happen. All sorts of things happen in the world. But if by unification you mean what is unusually officially said, that, say, the the North Korean leader and the South Korean leader will sit down, negotiate, and hug each other, then of course not. This was, in general, a propaganda fake from the very beginning, a very specific one. Yes. And one of the reasons, coming from South Korea, is that uh, the younger generation of South Koreans do not yes. want this. Yes. Because they realize it will be at the expense of their taxes. Yes, definitely. So this is not the only, but this is one of the reasons. The second reason is that the North Korean leadership, although they like to talk about it, they understand that there will be no place for them in a united country. Plus, they may become scapegoats because they will be blamed, so to speak, for all of the problems, and there will be many, many problems for them. Moreover, when... When I say to blame, it is implied that they are innocent, and in most cases, they're actually quite guilty. But uh, guilty or not, there's there's no need to answer it. And why? That is, n- neither one side nor the other really wants unification. I can imagine a situation, well, rather, let's say I can imagine a situation in which a unification will take place. For example, in the event of a revolution into the fall of the regime in the north, but the probability of this is very small, at least in the foreseeable future. The the north is beginning, apparently, to dream again of conquering the south. Uh, so such ideas are emerging there because their military strategy of recent years is clearly aimed at preparing for a new campaign in the south, is what they're doing. But this campaign, while they are preparing for it, will take several decades and most likely will never take place. So I think that unification is possible, but not as a result of some mutual negotiations, not as a result of some sort of mutual, so to speak, um, mutual hugs and agreements. And then the the probability of this was still far from being 100%, and I do not exclude it. But it is no coincidence that in recent months, literally, they started using the official name of South Korean stated, that is, South Korea, in an all-official North Korean documents. This name was never used before at all. Uh, Korea has two different uh, yes. names. Yes, yes. Two different names, completely different. So not the official name of the state, but how the country is called. In the south, they call themselves Hanguk. In the north, they call themselves Chosong. 
Before that, the Northerners, in all documents, when referring to the South, did not say that this is the country of Hanguk, but said that this is the country of South Chasan. That is, we are the true Chasan, and there was some South Chasan, which is, so to speak, currently under occupation. And now they're referring to them and as so Hanguk, just well, like South well, Koreans now, do. Since the summer of 2023, in official North Korean documents and speeches, they have begun to use this name. So it's as if they recognize it a standalone well, state. Well, yes, it is a step forward in the direction, so to speak. The question that always arises, uh, it was asked by Ilya Varlamov when he came to you in the summer of 2022. Yes, yes I remember about that time. Uh, the question is, how close Russian regime to North Korea? Oh, very far from each other. You said it back then. You said that the difference is huge, and yet there are some minor similarities, but still, you compared it to, it's like we have the flu, and you say that you have pneumonia. Tuberculosis, I would say, or even lung cancer. Yeah. Has your opinion changed no, one no, year later? No. no. In Russia, the corresponding trends have slightly strengthened, but the gap is so huge that I see no chance, fortunately, that it will ever be overcome. Ever. Uh, simply because the North Korean regime, firstly, was formed on a completely different cultural and social basis. You see, North Korea is a Confucian country. So, um, Confucian peasant country, a traditional one. It resembles China during the Great Leap Forward into the Cultural Revolution. It resembles, if you will, Cambodia, the Pol Pot era, but in a minor form, I would say. You see, this is a country where people are ready to believe very strongly in the authorities, where there is a spirit of collectivism, where people are ready to accept a, a very high level of violence from the state as the norm, there are many different things to this, very many different things, a variety of things. Moreover, the second point, the North Korean regime grew out of a revolution, a mass popular movement. Yes, this revolution was largely started by Soviet tanks, but uh, here is the old dispute of historians. So I adhere to my moderate compromise point of view here. Some say that, like, the North Korean regime was created as a puppet Soviet regime in 1945, and others would probably say that it was a revolution, a simple revolution. So I say to a large extent is a puppet regime, but it was very popular, and it has reflected real revolutionary sentiments. The people wanted paradise on Earth. This was a powerful mass popular movement. Into that paradise that they wanted, I think, would not have been very much to our liking because it would have been a country where everyone works together. And the state takes care of everyone, gives everyone to everyone for free. Everyone is ready to heroically sacrifice themselves where there is a wise leader. And we are building a wonderful country of equality, brotherhood, unity, with, with iron solidarity around the great leader. And there are officials who, while we are getting, while we all get a bowl of rice, or just get a bowl and half at most. And so this is what it is. Um, in ideology, well, I don't know. It was probably characteristic of traditional peasant Russia. But where is the traditional peasantry now? It has been gone for 200 years already. Uh, do you mean people themselves wanted this regime? I would say so, yes. So this is why they don't suffer from it yes, that yes, much yes. as Russian citizens do yes, now. Because in Russia, the social strata that, that generally supported such regimes disappeared nearly 150 years ago. But can't you just get used to it or train to tolerate such regime when they tighten the screws and mm -hmm. gradually suppress people's will? Well, we'll see, of course. There are very desperate experiments, but I think not. I think not, because for any, any regime, be that good or bad, it is necessary to resonate with what the people want. They need to address the people. And in North Korea, the people wanted this. Moreover, if many or even the majority of people from the 40s and 50s had known they would, it would all be end with, they might not have wanted it so much in the beginning with. But we're not able to foresee what a word, and even more so deed, will resonate with. But uh, but then the people wanted something that sort of organically developed into this situation. Well, they will also object to you that Putin was re-elected in his first term for the same reason, uh, because there was chaos in the country and people wanted a strong hand well, that would establish order. the difference between strong hands is very big. Under a strong hand, one can accept uh, both moderate and strong authoritarian regimes and even regimes that are sometimes called totalitarian. I just, I'm not really sure that this term has the right to be serious scientific existence. Well, but maybe it does. I don't really know about this, but I don't know. Uh, there are different points of view. I am not firmly convinced. There, there are always different shades, and this palette is very wide. I repeat, the, 
the majority of countries on the planet are actually authoritarian. That's an important point. In Russia, it's, I don't remember well, uh, I was talking to someone. The question implied that democracy is the norm, but democracy is not the norm. Liberal democracy is, in general, a fairly rare animal. Yes. So nowadays it is much more common than before. But if you look at the majority of countries in the world, they are quite authoritarian. North Korea, which is substantially less authoritarian than, my, than many might think, is probably still on the far flank. At least for now. Before it was clearly on the far end. Now it's a bit closer, probably. What are its competitors on this flank? Well, there are little-known countries like Eritrea, for example. Well, this is the African North Korea, basically. Well, yes, you could say that. Um, I'm trying to remember there's some other countries, but there are a few countries with the real serious state control, but more often there is control by local gangsters from which the population sometimes suffers more than from the state. And so, but I suppose that this is all a separate matter whatsoever. Are you upset that there are fewer democratic states than authoritarian regimes in the world? But it's always been like this. I was born in an era when it was always there. Maybe someday it'll be different. I will not live that long to see it. But I think the majority of our listeners will not either. Okay. While I was preparing for the interview with you, while I was reading your book, uh, listening to hours of your speeches, interviews, and I'm lectures. I'm glad you did so. Uh, I got the impression that I wanted to discuss with you. Uh, when listening to you, it feels like you normalize the life in North yes. Korea. And why shouldn't I normalize it? This is a regime that due, due to various factors, including its own stupid, ambitious attempts to promote itself in its own way. One of the reasons why they have had such a bad reputation is that in the 60s and 70s, they invested a lot of money into little brains, into propaganda, in their own pre -R. So... Back then, North Korean magazines were sold everywhere across the Soviet Union. Albania was a more fun place, if we can even use this word, a way more fun place than North Korea in the 1970s, really because they did not engage in propaganda, and so no one noticed it. Mm -hmm. So they accidentally, well, not really actually, created a very odious reputation for themselves, a place that in many ways is extremely unusual and unpleasant. I wouldn't want to live there. I think that the majority of those who are now sit, uh, staying in Russia, how good it is there, would also not want to live there either, in the real North Korea, not in the North Korea of their fantasies. Okay. But firstly, North Korea is a country where North Koreans live, and they do live there. And secondly, the world, you see, is not a narrow enough circle of developed and rich, mostly democratic, not always, by the way, states that also have their own problems, of course, but... I suppose, of course, less unpleasant compared to the North Korean, but also the world is quite an unpleasant thing in general. The majority of people in the world live in rather unpleasant places. And if they are not afraid of the secret police, then they are afraid of local thugs, for example. And in many cases, the choice is this. Either you will be afraid of the secret police, you have certain rules, do, do not joke about the leader, for example. Or you will be afraid of the thug, who has fewer rules, maybe. Also, you will be afraid of hunger. Yes, for East Asia, hunger is now untypical. Therefore, it can be said that, yes, the North Korean famine of the 90s was largely a result of not so much bad luck, although it also was there, as strategic mistakes of the authorities, which, for various reasons, they either could not or did not want to correct. But in general, hunger existed in the world. And yes, I can say that. For me, North Korea is a country that needs to be studied without emotions, not as some black or white case. So, well, that's what I would say. Uh, sorry, I'm here. I may be using slightly inappropriate wordings, but here is my answer. And, and I believe that any country should be studied in this way. Even if you have emotions, you should, as they, as they say in the Russian criminal circles, filter the speech. In my younger years, I did this a bit worse. So now, in general, I've come to terms with a lot. And in other cases, I realized that emotions, well, are you full of emotions when you read about the military crimes of the Assyrian regime in the 7th century BC? Are you, when you read about it? But that was a long time that ago. That was a long time ago. And far away. And so I believe that if you consider yourself a historian and want to be a historian and not a propagandist of the history, then you should perceive everything that is happening, including in those places 
that are very close to you, the, through this very prism. This doesn't mean that you should participate in it, but even if you participate in something, by the way, I advise you to think about it 20 times. You can participate, but use your head first, because, no. because emotional screams, right? Well, emotional screams is characteristic to propaganda departments. You can be emotional there as well, well, um, as much as you want. But if a person wants to be engaged in history, he or she should use their head first, leaving the emotions behind, because he should think with his head. He should be objective, calm and objective, be able to see black, white, gray, in all other shades of the big and diverse palette. So, uh, uh, yet again, they say everything's bad in North Korea, but let me tell you something good about North Korea. North Korea is a phenomenally educated for such a poor country. And until recently, it had no longer has though. This advantage is not fully exhausted, but is being exhausted. The country had a fairly good average level of expected lifespan, despite the hunger, despite the repressions. The average North Korean, until recently, lived longer than people from countries with similar income levels comparable to this time. You can say quite fairly that North Korean regime is largely responsible for the fact that the country remains so poor. And this is also true. But at the same time, if under a different regime, North Korean incomes would be higher and North Koreans would live longer, this is also true. But at the same time, given the current level of income, they live very long. Why? Due to the advantage of a police state that takes some prevention matters very seriously. They have a desensitization. Cheap doctors who are paid very little, who are bad doctors, but there are many of them. More doctors per 10,000 population than in France. Yes, they have almost no medicine. They do not have the best training. But I suppose until you are in your 70s, you usually die from diseases that do not require super equipment for treatment. You just need to quickly realize which antibiotics you should take, and that's it. You see, in case of peritonitis, they put you one in the table, and they operate you. What doesn't have to finish Super Academy of Harvard to be able to do this operation? That's it. I totally agree with your approach of history, but uh, I would disagree with your take on life expectancy. We can find such arguments anywhere. Well, no, not I mean, anywhere. Far from it. One can find advantages in Stalin's yes, of Russia. of course, and I do find them. I am sitting here thanks to Stalin's Russia. I understand. I did not like the Soviet system in many ways, but but I understand that, for example, there were certain social elevators there into which I, a person from a regular working class family, got in and went up. In modern Russia, I also see such elevators, but I feel that they run worse. That's all? No, not anywhere. Far from it, of course. For example, to, to say that you can go to, go to prison for telling a joke. Well, I find this... Uh, I find this very difficult to agree with this. Many economic measures are based on a completely ridiculous idea of how human society works and are absolutely counterproductive there. So I think many things, but in any case... Do you mean just, in Stalin's you know, Russia? What, in Stalin's Russia. In Stalin's Russia and in Kim Il-sung's North Korea, which copied it. Um, but despite all this, one should not forget about the white color. The world is multicolored. The world is multicolored. And even if you have emotions, cool down, understanding that, yes, there is this aspect, but there is also another aspect. Maybe the good aspect is many times less important than the bad. This must also be understood. But you need to see the whole picture. You need to see the whole picture. You need to understand the interests of all the players involved. Okay, so in short, in North Korea, there are more bad aspects, yes. right? Yes, 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 yes. However, this country is far from the caricature that is, is often portrayed as. I extremely want to ask you, a person who has studied dictatorship all his life, uh, so wherein is power? Political? Uh, you may answer however you prefer to. Mm. The power of a politician lies in his ability to resonate with society and know how to use this flow to some extent to be able to partly direct it within the boundaries desirable to him, that is, if he is a good politician and a major one. That's it. Power lies in the fact that the power of a politician lies in the fact that he feels the flow and knows how to use this flow and sometimes it steers it slightly, slightly because the possibilities are limited. How about general, like, basic sense? This is a deep philosophical question. 
better to ask some wise man from a Buddhist temple. He will say something hard to understand and subject to 253 interpretations. I can't do that. <laughs> 